John Sharian and Bryony Glasgow in Pet Cemetery by Stephen King. Dramatised for radio by Gregory Evans. Pet Cemetery. Oh, that drive. That long, long drive. Rachel was feeling shaky about the move. To a house she'd never seen. In a state she'd never even been to before. Ellie was simply sick and tired of being cooped up in the car. And Gage. Poor kid. Gage was teething. Rachel tried, but she couldn't seem to calm him. Why don't you try giving him the breast? I'll try, but it's off his schedule. You know what he's... Okay, come on. Ow! Oh, he's bit me! He's drawn blood! Seems like that front two's come through then. Why are we doing this, Lewis? I don't want to leave Chicago. I don't want to live in Maine. Daddy! Mystic feminine symbol. Oh, 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 brother, now you've woken church. Great. Suddenly I had this great idea. I'd stop for gas, trick my family into getting out, then floor the pedal and head south, drive all the way to Florida, get a job under a false name, and before I hit the freeway, slow down and toss the damn cat out, too. Is this? Yes, this is. Big field behind the house, that's ours. Right up to those woods at the top of the hill. Old Indian lands. On the map, they seem to go on forever. Well, what do you think? It's, it's just beautiful. Daddy, is this home? Yes, honey. It will be. That moment, when we turned into the driveway and got our first look at that old white frame house, always held a magical quality for me. But what happened next, that wasn't magic at all. I put them in the glove compartment. Me, they had a tag. Me. Keys for Ludlow House. Oh, oh. Ellie, be careful! Oh, no! Oh, my God! Don't touch! Don't hey. touch! Don't touch! Ellie, it's nothing. It's not nothing. It hurts, Daddy. It hurts. We well, have a bruise, honey. <laughs> Gage? Lewis, what's wrong with him? It, it's a pee. A pee. Lou, you're the doctor. Do something. Well, uh, let me get that stinger out. Huh? Uh, Who are you? Come here, Lou. Uh, no, Gage doesn't really take to strangers. No. Hey, oh, now that's a big one. Could win a prize with that. <laughs> Pleased to meet you, Mr. Judge Crandall, live across the road. You're the doc, ain't you? Yes, Louis Creed. Oh. Uh, this is my wife, Rachel. Rachel. Hello. And my daughter, Ellie. Hi, Ellie. Hi. Kid with the bee sting's cage. Well, good to know you all. Why don't you take these lovely children over to our house, Mrs. Creed? Norma, my wife, she'd like to say hello. She put some baking soda in a wash rag, cool off that sting. That's very kind of you, Mr. Crandall. I generally just answer the judge. judge. Daddy, what's that over there? Uh, looks like a path. Yeah, Missy, it is a path. I'll tell you about it sometime. Oh, God. Watch your young'uns on the road, Mrs. Creed. Very dangerous stretch of highway. Rachel and the kids went off while Judd helped me find the keys, which had slipped down into the wiring behind the glove compartment. By then, the moving van had arrived. Uprooted and transplanted, huh? You sound like you know the feeling. Well, actually, I don't. My dad built that house across the way. I was born there in 1913. I've lived there ever since. 1913? Yeah. That makes you... 83. 
<laughs> you don't look it. Well. <laughs> uh, that one goes upstairs. Okay, doctor. The small bedroom. I'll show you. I'll go over, see how your folks are doing, Doc. Okay. I usually sit out on my porch about nine of an evening, have a couple of beers. Come over if you don't mind. By nine o'clock, the movers had gone, leaving boxes everywhere. Ellie and Gage were asleep in their new rooms, Gage in his crib, Ellie on a mattress on the floor. As usual, Church was with her, curled at her feet, keeping guard. I kissed my kids and went to find Rachel. Oh, I was unpacking. Oh, I sat down for a moment. Bed, now. Doctor's orders? Yes. You coming, Lou? Not yet. I'm whack, but I'm too wired to sleep. That old guy across the street said road. that he had... You call it a road in the country. Uh, road. <laughs> he invited me over for a beer. I might take him up on it. Put an extra couple on ice in the pail by your elbow. Thanks, Judd. Ah, oh, I needed that. I hope you'll be happy here in Ludlow, Doc. Amen to that. Your wife uh, going to bed already? Yep. Arthritis was getting to her. It's got bad the last two years. She don't complain, though. She's a good girl, my Norma. One hell of a big truck. What is Orinco, anyway? Factory in Orrington. Chemical fertilizer. Then there's tankers and dumpsters and folks who are working banger coming home at night. You know, that's the one thing about Ludlow I don't care for anymore. That darn road, no peace from it. Uh, seems all very peaceful to me, but then I just come from Chicago. Yeah, that's one mean road, all right. Remember that path your little girl mentioned? A wide grass path going into the trees. It goes through the woods for more than a mile. Local kids keep it nice, mow the grass. So, uh, what's up there? The pet cemetery. Pet cemetery? This damn road uses up a lot of animals. Dogs and cats, mostly. Rabbits. Even a pet raccoon the rider kids <laughs> kept. All buried up at the cemetery. Tough on a kid and a good animal gets killed, <clears throat> like a death in the family. Well, my daughter's got a cat, Winston oh. Churchill. Church, for sure. Still got his balls? Come again? Has he been fixed? Oh, <laughs> no. Uh, Rachel wanted it done in Chicago, but since we're moving here to the country, I figured it wouldn't matter. Get him fixed. A fixed cat don't wander. If he's forever crossing this road, he'll run through his nine lives pretty damn quick. Thanks, I'll take it under advisement. How's that beer doing? Beer's all gone, and so am I. I start work tomorrow. Head medic of the university, right, Doc? Yeah. Students don't get back for another two weeks, thank God, but when they do, there'll be 10,000 of them with drugs or liquor problems, social mm. diseases, depression, not to mention all the usual bugs and viruses. So if you don't know where the pills are, I guess you're in trouble, huh? <laughs> That's right. Well, thanks for the beer, Judd. And for the talk. Really enjoyed it. So did I. Well, my best to, uh, to Norma. See you around. Yep. The next two weeks roared by like one of those big Orinko trucks out on the highway. My job began to shake down. Rachel set about turning the house into a home and so fell in love with the place. Gage survived all the bumps and spills that went with getting used to his new environment. Ellie survived her first day at her new school. My evening beer with Judd became something of a habit. I met his wife, Norma, a sweet old woman cursed with rheumatoid arthritis. That last Sunday before the college kids came back, we were out on the front lawn. It was already two weeks into September, but the weather was still all August. Judd! Hi, Judd. Let me get your chair. No need, Lewis. I ain't come to sit. Ellie, you still want to see where that old path goes? Uh, yes, please. A boy at school told me it was the pet cemetery. So it is. If it's okay with your folks, we'll take us a stroll up there right now. Oh, uh, 
maybe you'd like to come too? Yeah, we'd love to. Um, what about Gage? I thought it was more than a mile. Well, I'll put him in the backpack. Okay, but it's your back, mister. They call this Prospect Hill. <sighs> Look back, you'll see why. Oh, it's gorgeous. <laughs> Lewis, why didn't you tell me about this? I didn't know it was here. Well, that's the Penobscot River. Years ago, loggers floated timber downstream to Bangor and Derry. And you can see the spire of North Ludlow yeah. Baptist poking <laughs> through those elms. Nelly, uh -huh. that matchbox down there, that's your school. Really? <laughs> cool. Gorgeous is right. Honey, do we own this hill? It's part of the property, yeah. Uh, which is not quite the same thing. What are those pots and coffee cans, Judd? Local kids put them along the path to hold flowers. Ellie? Yes, Mr. Crandall? This is a fine walk for a little girl. If you come here by yourself, you must always stay on the path. Promise? I promise. Why? Uh, can we stop for a minute? This is one heavy kid. Yeah, sure. Where are we, Judd? Well, that way, that's North Ludlow. Huh? This way, nothing but woods for 50 mile or more. Joins up with those Indian lands I told you about. The Micmacs. Clever girl, the Micmacs. They were here before anyone. 2,000 years ago, maybe. No one really knows. Your little house down there on the main road with its phone, electricity, and cable TV is on the edge of a wilderness. I don't want you coming up here unless you're with a grown-up, Ellie. Well, I don't mean to scare you, Rachel. It's a safe path. Local kids come up here all the time. Like a lot of things in life, Ellie. Stick to the path, all's well. Stray off it, next thing you know, there's a search party beating the bushes. How are you doing, hon? I swear Gage has put on ten pounds since we left home. <laughs> Do you want me to take him for a while? Oh, it's all right. I'm fine. Hey, I'm not so sure this is such a good idea, Lewis. What if we get lost? Oh, hey, come on, city girl. We won't get lost. I've got a native guide. Not far now. Up ahead, I saw Ellie and Judd pass under an arch made of weather-stained boards. The boards had words written on them in faded black paint. Pet Sem at Ari. Huh. Oh, no prizes for spelling. Oh, my God. Mom, Dad, isn't it just lovely? We were in a circle of mown grass 40 feet across. There was dense undergrowth on three sides and an old deadfall on the fourth. A chaos of fallen trees that looked sinister and dangerous. The clearing was crowded with markers apparently made by children out of whatever they could find. Crate slats, scraps of tin, rocks, old slates. Come and look. Hang on. I just got to take care of Gage here. Mm, here, let me help. Ooh, oh, you boy. get a little fella. Stretch your legs. Oh, boy, that's better. I'll stay here and keep an eye on him. Are you okay with this, Rachel? Fine, honestly. Okay. Smucky the cat. 1986 to 1989, he was... Obedient. <laughs> Must have been the same kid who wrote the sign. Here, look at this one. Biffer, Biffer, a hell of a sniffer. Before he died, he made us richer. Biffer was the Dresler Spaniel. <clears throat> yeah. Got hit by a dumpster in 1968, I think it was. It's incredible. I've seen churchyards that aren't so well kept. I, it looks random at first, but you can see a pattern in Concentric circles. Mom, Mom, look. Here's a goldfish. I'll pass, thanks. Rachel okay? Yeah, she's not too good with cemeteries, Judd. Even oh. animal ones. Yeah, anything to do with death, come to that. Her sister died when she was a kid and never really got over it. Louis, you should have no, said. No, no, it's fine. I'm glad you brought us here. Trixie. Killed on the road, 1939? How far back does this go, Judd? I buried my first dog here. Spot died of old age in 1930. Been around a long time then. Yeah, in those days, I had a gang of friends to help me. Well, I'm the last of that yeah. gang now. 
<laughs> All gone. All dead. Yeah. Gage is hungry. We, we ought to go back. Uh, sure, honey. Dad! Ellie! No! No, 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 Ellie, come down off of there. Honey, Ellie. be careful. Come. Put your foot wrong. Those old trees could break your ankle. Ellie! Oh, Ellie. Ellie, you must never climb a deadfall. Trees that fall down on each other like that get mean. Ellie, are you okay? You tore my pants, you cruddy trees. <laughs> Strange. A deadfall, somehow it doesn't look quite natural. Just fallen trees, Lou. Oh, it almost looks like stairs leading to Lou? some... Lou, Lou, can we go now, please? Uh, yeah, yeah, sure, coming. Boy, all those graves. Mm, better than a hundred, I'd say. A lot of cats up there, Dad. Cats, dogs, rabbits. There was even a parrot. Did you see that? How long do cats live, Daddy? Oh, they can live a long, long time. Take Church, for example. He might still be around when you're going off to college. It doesn't seem long to me, not long at all. Ellie... If it was up to me, I'd let church live to be a hundred, but uh, I don't make the rules. Who does? God, I suppose. Oh, God, or... I don't want church to die. He's my cat, not God's. Church is mine. Ellie can't get to sleep without church. Do you know where he is? Probably out chasing tail. Damn pet cemetery. I won't be writing Judd Crandall any thank you notes for that little hike. Rachel. Ellie is not going up there again, ever. Kids tending graves. It's unhealthy. It's only pets. She thinks church is going to die. Rachel, church is going to die. Not today. Not for years yet. We don't know that. Of course we know. Church is not going to die, Lewis. No one's going to die around here, all right? Rachel, what is this about? Is it Zelda? Death's bad enough without turning it into a goddamn tourist attraction. A, a boot hill for pets. Well, not, there's nothing wrong with a child finding out about death, Rachel. It's necessary. <laughs> Ellie's reaction, crying, worrying about church, it's, it's perfectly natural. Nothing about death is natural, Lou. What? As a doctor, you ought to know that. As a doctor, I know that death's the most natural thing in the world. Oh, will you stop saying that? Oh, great. Now you won't engage. Rachel, what if church does die? Oh, for Christ's sake, Lou. Gets leukemia, gets hit by a car on that road. I can't listen to this. I've got to go to my son. We'd have to tell Ellie then. Let me go! Or would you ignore it? Bury it? Oh. Oops. Don't say bury. You'll give her a compliment. I hate you! My God. What was that all about? Church. Oh, am I glad to see you. Treasure your cojones while you've got them, church, old boy, because I'm going to get you fixed. Stop you crossing that mean old road. Next morning, the day 10,000 students arrived on campus, the storm seemed to be over. About last night. I'm sorry. No, it's fine. I understand. Well, some of it anyway. So? Do I look like a hotshot university doctor? <laughs> no, just like old Lou Creed. <laughs> the rock and roll animal. I'll see you later. As I drove onto campus, I saw the university had suddenly come alive. Students were everywhere, walking, jogging, driving, cycling. I parked the car in a space with a freshly painted sign reserved for Dr. Creed and hurried into the infirmary, where I met Steve Masterton, the physician's assistant who'd first shown me around. Oh, hi, Doc. You ready for the fray? Ready as I'll ever be. Meet Holly, our new nurse. She'll be working the 9 to 3 shift. Good morning, Dr. Creed. Good to have you aboard, Holly. Um, let's go into my office. I'll run through your duties. Looking back, when I can bear to look back, I believe the nightmare really began when they brought in that dying boy in the T-shirt and jogging shorts, Victor Pascal. We in 
inventory the dangerous drugs cabinet once a week. All right. Steve usually does it, but if he's not Lewis! around or if you happen Lewis, to be here... get out of here quick! We got ourselves a mess! Oh, my God. The blood. The blood. Oh, my God. Holly, oh my stop God. that. Oh, my God. Stop oh God. it! Oh right oh now! Oh what happened? Oh he was jogging and a car hit him. Smashed him into a tree. Oh Lewis, he's dying. Half his brains are on the floor. Okay, close the drapes. We don't want an audience. What? what? Do it! Name? Victor Pascal. Okay, Victor, lie still. Don't try and move. How did he get here? Some students brought him in a blanket. Holly, use my phone call. East Main Medical Center. Uh, okay. Ooh, he won't Tell them to long. prepare to receive a major cranial trauma. Then call campus security. I want a cop car here now. He can't wait for an ambulance. Right. Steve, yeah. find the guys who brought him in. Take them to the other door. I want them handy, but I don't want them to see this. Right. Okay, okay. It's okay, Victor. It's okay, you're gonna be fine. In the pet cemetery. What did you say? Not the real cemetery. What? What are you telling me? A man grows what he can, Lewis. How did you know my name? Who are you? Who are you? There's a police car on its way. The brought in Pascal. Wait. Lewis? I'm afraid, uh... Victor Pascal is dead. Lewis Creed. Hi, honey. Are you all right? Yeah, just about. I heard about it on the radio. Lou, I'm so sorry. Yeah, hell of a first day. Louis, I love you. Would you come home? Yeah, home sounds good. Hello, big boy. My God, Rachel. Don't let the neighbors see you like that. Well, don't stand there with your mouth open, then. Come inside. Um, where did you get the, uh... Little lingerie store and banger. Scandalously expensive. I've been, uh, saving it for a special occasion. Mm. Uh, where are the kids? Missy Dandridge took them. We're on our own for two and a half hours. So let's not waste it. Well, are you coming upstairs or not? Rachel's medicine worked wonders for me. I expected to lie awake. Instead, I slid smoothly into sleep. I was almost there when... Taking in the day after tomorrow. Hmm? Church. To the vet to get fixed. Hmm. Poor church. Mm. Poor church. <sighs> Who's there? Pascal. Get up, doctor. We got places to go. I can't go with you. You're dead. I can see it. Oh, God. Your head. Your head. Shh. You don't wait for your life. Come on. Now. I followed Pascal downstairs and into the kitchen. When he glanced back, I could see the hole in his skull, the blood on his face like Indian war paint, the collarbone jutting through the skin. For a moment I lost him and I thought with relief that the dream was ending, and I felt cool wind on my body, and I realized I was outside. I saw Pascal standing in the moonlight by the path to the pet cemetery. This way, Doctor. No, I don't want to go up there. You have to. Oh. 
You're no slouch, are you? For a dead guy. <laughs> This is a dream, right? I mean, I'm home in bed. Okay, so it's more vivid than most. In the morning, I'll wake up next to Rachel. Shut up. <laughs> Keep walking. Oh, a branch scratched my arm and drew blood. Ahead, Pascal was a moving shadow. At last, the wooden archway. The clearing, washed by moonlight. The leaning markers. Bits of board and tin and slate. Names and dates. Pascal stopped by Smucky the Cat. He was obedient and pointed. Look at the deadfall, Doctor. It's alive! Bones! Bones! This barrier was not made to be broken. I gotta scream myself awake! I got to scream myself awake! I got to scream myself awake! You must not go beyond this, no matter how much you feel the need. Get away from me! Get away! There is more power here than you can understand. It is old and always restless. Remember this. Get away from me! Your destruction and the destruction of those you love is very near. Remember. Okay, babe. I'm awake. Come and give me a kiss, and you better go. This girl in school, Judy D'Alessio, she's got a little brother. Dad? What have you done to your arm? What? Your arm, Dad. How did you scratch your arm? It's been bleeding. I... I don't know. Ellie, I... you missed the bus! Gotta go, Dad. Okay, Ellie. Bye now. When she'd gone downstairs, I pushed back the quilt and looked at my feet. They were filthy, with mud and dirt and pine needles. Center, Pathology Department. Uh, this is Dr. Lewis Creed, head of University Medical Services. What can I do for you, Dr. Creed? Uh, you have one of our students in your facility, uh, Victor Pascal? Not anymore, Doc. He's gone. What? His body was put on a plane to Newark last night. Oh, yes, right. Where did you think he went? Out dancing at the uh, show ring? No, no, it's, uh, it's just, um... It seems very quick. Well, he was autopsied yesterday afternoon. By then, his parents had made all the arrangements. I guess the body got to Newark around two in the morning. You wanted to speak to me, Lou? Yeah. Uh, shut the door, will you, Steve? Yes. Victor Pascal. He wasn't from around here, was he? No, no. Uh, somewhere in New Jersey. Uh, uh, Bergenfield, I think it was. No local connections at all. I mean... Before he enrolled at the university. Well, there's nothing in his records. Uh, well, why the curiosity, Lou? Uh, Steve, I'm telling you this because... Well, I need to tell someone. Just keep it to yourself, okay? Okay. I had... 
a very odd experience last night. Pascal came to me in a dream, and then I think I went sleepwalking. Sleepwalking? Yeah, right out of the house. Up, well, quite a way. Uh, with Pascal leading. Jeez, Lou. To a place that Rachel and I had an argument about a few days ago. So do you want to call? Call who? Funny Farm. Get them to send the van. I don't think so, Lewis. Uh, not yet, anyway. <laughs> Look, having a student die on you like that in such a horrible way, it's, it's deeply upsetting. Mm. It certainly upset me. So you went sleepwalking with Pascal, too, did you? <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> but I, I didn't have the added stress of a new job. You were under a hell of a lot of pressure, Lewis. And that can make the mind do weird things. Mm. If you had a fight with Rachel, too, well, well it all goes into the mix. I'm gonna go for a walk. It's Mare. Uh, will you be back to put Gage to bed? You know he goes down better for you. Sure. Where are you going, Daddy? Uh, just out back, hun. Nowhere special. Fifteen minutes later, I was in the pet cemetery. The little marker honoring the memory of Smucky the cat was knocked over. I'd done that last night. And Pascal came towards me, and I fell to my knees in terror. I set it straight again and walked over to the deadfall. Look at the deadfall, Doctor. This barrier was not made to be broken. You must not go beyond this, no matter how much you feel the need. It wasn't bones anymore, thank God, though it still had the power to chill. It was a dense mass of dead branches and wicked-looking thorns. Without thinking what I was doing, I began to climb. In the second before I fell, or was thrown from the deadfall, I got a glimpse over the top. I could have sworn I saw a path leading into the woods. The Indian summer passed. Color rioted in the trees, then faded. Life settled into a demanding but pleasant routine. My dream and the sleepwalking incident came to seem like events that had happened to someone else or that I'd seen on TV a long time ago. By mid-October, the leaves began to fall. Halloween arrived. Coming. Daddy, stay back. I'm doing this. Okay, Ellie, it's your show. Trick or treat! Oh. Woo! Oh, ho, ho. Hey, Norma, come see the Wicked Witch. The Wicked Witch. She looks great. She's just the cutest thing. <laughs> really, open your cheek okay. bag. Oh, oh, Norma. Darn oh, old hands. <laughs> Here's the Snicker bar, honey. Let me get you another apple. Yeah. That one will bruise. Oh, it's fine, Norma. I don't want a bruised apple, Daddy. Yuck. Ellie, that is really rude. But don't scold her for truth telling, Lewis. Yeah. Brown spots are yucky. <laughs> Step inside, Ellie. Yeah. We'll find you a fresh one. Yeah. Ooh, yeah, that's that's a great How long has Norma's arthritis been like that? Since the wet weather started up. Comes down harder on her every fall. It's never been this bad. What does her doctor say? She won't go to see him. Why not? Oh, there's a new doctor. Young guy, just out of med school. Norma <laughs> Daddy, Daddy, Mrs. Crano fell down! Oh, my God, Norma! Chad, Chad, my, ch my chest! Ellie, go sit on the porch. But, Daddy... Everything's gonna be fine, honey. Just stay on the porch. Lewis, yes, I think she's dying. Uh, Extreme arrhythmia. Could become full cardiac arrest. <laughs> Judd, take Ellie home. Tell Rachel I need my bag from the study. Get her to call an ambulance and come straight back with that bag. Uh -huh. Lois, I fell, I fell down. I think I fainted. Norma, relax. Don't try and talk.
she be okay, Lewis? Really okay? No guarantees, Judd. It was a heart attack, but it was a small one, and we got to her quickly. So, for what it's worth, I think she'll be fine. Are you gonna be okay? Yeah. Lewis, I owe you one. Will you carry my treat bag, Daddy? Gosh, I'm honored. Whoa, that is heavy. Will Mrs. Crandall die tonight? I don't think so, no. Well, people who have heart attacks usually die. Well, sometimes, not always. Well, she's old, so she'll die pretty soon anyway. Can I have another Snicker bar, Daddy? No, honey. Have an apple instead. Lou, you still awake? Just about. This, this business with Norma, was Ellie very upset? No, I thought she handled it very well. Good night, Rachel. Good night, Lou. I don't know if the wind woke me or something else, but I knew immediately that Pasco had come back. Only now, two months had passed, and when the door opened, I'd see a rotting horror. Clothes caked with mold, flesh fallen away, the brain decayed to paste. Only the eyes would be alive, and they would beckon. Church. <sighs> Come on. I'll get you some milk. Oh, Lewis. They're beautiful. Oh, Rachel picked them. She's at home with Ellie and Gage. Judd, get a vase from one of the nurses. Yes, ma'am. Oh, <laughs> don't be smart. You always feel ever so much better. <laughs> Certainly look at Norma. You've got the roses back in your cheeks. Thanks to you. Judd says I owe you my life. Oh, Judd's exaggerating. I don't think so, Louis. You're a dear man. Judd says you're going to be all alone for Thanksgiving. Uh, Rachel's taking the kids to her mom and dad in Chicago. I'd like to go, but I've got too much work. I don't like to think of you alone in that house. I'll be fine. I'm going to Judd and Norma's for Thanksgiving dinner. I've got a paper to write. Besides, I don't go in for these family get-togethers anyway. <laughs> Not with my family, you Line don't. 346 to Chicago, now boarding at gate two. Oh, that's us? Mom, come on, they'll go without us. No, they won't. I love you, Lewis Creed. And I love you, Ryko. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Bye, Gage. How come you didn't go with them, Lou? I didn't want to miss Norma's turkey. Oh, smells good. Plus, uh, I don't exactly get along with Mr. and Mrs. Irwin Goldman. Rachel's parents, huh? Yeah. They didn't like me from the start. Wrong side of the tracks and all that. I'm not good enough for their precious little girl. Never have been, never will be. You sound a little bitter about that. Well, maybe I've got a reason. I never told Rachel this, but Irwin tried to buy me off. How do you mean? He offered to pay my entire tuition through med school. Oh? A scholarship, he called it. The price was that I break off my engagement to Rachel at once and forever. Louis, that's low, even for in-laws. I came at a bad time. A flat broke, waiting tables, working in bars. I was studying 40 hours a week. Drew out his checkbook like a gun. Told him where to shove it. He told me he wanted to shoot me like a dog. Jeez, Lewis. Oh, we're polite when we meet, but I've never forgiven him for it. And he's never forgiven me for marrying his daughter. Mm. 
Rachel. Uh, sorry to disappoint you, Lewis. Oh, Chut. I must have had one too many of your beers this afternoon. What can I do for you? Uh, Lewis, I'm afraid you may have a spot of trouble. What trouble? There's a dead cat in our lawn. I think it might be your daughter's. <sighs> mine. Ah, rather Ellie's. Poor kid. Guess he was run down. Though it hardly looks to be a mark on him. Mm. Neck's broken. Whatever hit him must have flung him onto your lawn. I guess Ellie loved him, huh? Yeah. She did. What you gonna do with her? I brought a hefty bag. Guess I'll put him in the garage, bury him tomorrow. In the pet cemetery? I don't know. I suppose so. How are you going to tell Ellie? I'll have to mull that one over for a while. Hold this open for me, will you? Jeez. Like a sack of sand. Oh, thanks, Judd. Happy Thanksgiving. Lewis, wait here. I'll be right back. Carry the shovel. We can't bury him tonight. We can. We're gonna. Judd, it's dark. It's late. It's cold. Come on, I've... Lewis. Let's get it done. I'll do it tomorrow when I can see. Ellie love that cat? Yes, I told and you. And you love her? Of course I love her. She's my daughter. Come on, man. All right. Where should I dig? Not here. Rest a while. Not here? We're going... Somewhere else. This is totally crazy. But I feel better tonight than I have in five, six years. Like I'm home at last. Home and whole. Sounds bizarre when I'm just about to bury my daughter's cat, but it's the flat truth, Judd. I feel good. You don't pick your times for feeling good any more than you do for the other. I think it's this place that's got something to do with it. The pet cemetery. Maybe so, but you don't want to trust that, Lewis. Heroin makes junkies feel good when they put it in their arms. But all the time it's poisoning their mind and body. But this place could be like that, and don't you ever forget it. Oh, I hope to... God, I'm doing right. I don't understand what you're talking about, Judd. This place has power, Lewis. Not here so much, but where we're going. Where are we going? Come on. The deadfall? Judd, are you crazy? We can't climb that. Follow me. Judd, it's lethal. We'll break our legs and freeze to death. Just follow, Lewis. Don't falter, don't hold on to anything, and don't look down. I know the way, but it has to be done quick and sure. This is lunacy. But there was no snap of a branch giving way, no sickening plunge. My shoes did not slip on the old dry moss that had overgrown the fallen trees. I moved casually, almost sauntered, up then down the other side. <sighs> Made it. Judd, we made it. Come on. We got a piece to walk here. Three miles or more. There is a power here. I can feel it. In the air. In the ground. Coming to what the Micmacs called Little God Swamp. There's quicksand and other things, too. What other things? You might see some Elmo's fire. Sailors call foo lights. Makes funny shapes. It's nothing, just look the other way. You may hear voices, too. It's, well, that's just the loons down south toward Prospect. It's sound carries. Loons this time of year? This is like the deadfall, Lewis. We've got to go steady and easy. Keep our heads. with a shovel. We could be pirates. Off to bury doubloons by the dark of the moon. Only it's not treasure I'm burying. It's 
That's my daughter's castrated cat. It's warmer here. Never seen ground fog like this before. Like wading through snow. Is it a moose? A bear? Be quiet. Stay still. Grip on yourself, Lewis. What was that? Just a loom. We're almost there. Steps here, cut into the rock. Steps? Yeah, 42, 44. I, I, I can't remember. When we get to the top, we're there. Three, four, five. We climbed up to a flat rock that rose clear above the woods. In the dim moonlight, it looked like a chopped off hill or bizarre mesa. A geological freak that would have been more in place in New Mexico or Arizona. A wind blew, hard and clean. I felt a sense of total emptiness, but an emptiness that somehow vibrated. There were dark shapes. Cairns. Grave markers like the slates and slats in the pet cemetery. This is a seriously weird place. How did he get to be this peculiar shape? Mick Max did it. Sanded off the whole top of the hill. No one knows how. Any more than we know how the Mayans built their pyramids. John, what's this all about? This is the Mick Mac burying ground, Lewis. And you're here to bury Ellie's cat. Yeah, well, why here? Why not the I pet cemetery? I help you dig, but you gotta do it yourself. Each buries his own. That's how it's always been done. Why are you doing this, Judd? Because you saved Norma's life. Here. Soil's thin. You'll need this. All right. <clears throat> this do? Now pick out the rocks for your cam. And don't steal from anyone else's. Oh, Chad, come on. It's Ellie's cat. She'd want it done right. Tell me what's going on. Please. The Micmacs believed this was a magic place. So they buried their dead here, away from everything else. Other tribes steered clear of it, said the woods were full of ghosts. Maybe they saw the Foo Fire, the little god swamp. Yeah, maybe. Later, not even the Micmacs came. They said it had been visited by a Wendigo. Some kind of Indian spirit, right? The ground had gone sour. Whatever the hell that means. You think it's magic? It's certainly dangerous, Lewis. But not for dogs or cats. Go on, bury your animal. Judge, just... Go on! So long, church. It took me 20 minutes to fill the grave. Another 10 to pile up the rocks for the cairn. When the job was done, I felt a small, tired pleasure. It looked right, there with the others in the moonlight. Though as we left the plateau, I noticed the other Cairns were in ruins. You did good, Lewis. I knew you would. These Cairns, they've all been... kicked over or something. Let's get out of here. I hardly remember going back. But as we came down the path behind my house... It suddenly hit me how crazy and downright dangerous the whole expedition had been. The deadfall, the swamp. We could have died up there, both of us. How you feeling, Lou? Whacked. What time's it, Judd? Uh, just gone 8.30. Is that all? I thought See you didn't... tomorrow, Louis. Judd! What did we do up there tonight? Buried your daughter's cat. Is that all? <laughs> You're a good man, but you ask too many questions. Sometimes a man does what feels right in his heart, then after he ends up not feeling right, like it was a mistake. Know what I mean, Lewis? I guess so. But you gotta do what's in your heart, not question it, right? Well, I'm not... Right, so don't question it, Lewis. Accept what's done. Tell me one thing. Maybe. Have you ever 
use that place? I buried my dog Spot up there when I was ten. After he was killed on the road. The night noise. Buried my first dog here, Spot. Died of old age. Buried my dog Spot up there when I was ten. After he was killed on the road. Mm, can't be so. It can't be so. This barrier was not made to be broken. You must not go beyond this, no matter how much you feel the need. There is more power here than you can understand. It is old and always restless. Sometimes a man does what feels right in his heart, then after he ends up not feeling right, like it was a mistake. Your destruction and the destruction of those you love is very near. No, leave me alone! No, no! I woke up sweating, listening to the wind in the eaves and the drag and lurch of footsteps. But I knew it was a dream, and though many other inexplicable things happened, I was never bothered by the specter of Victor Pascal again waking or dreaming. Louis Creed. Hi, Lou. Did I wake you? <sighs> no need to sound so pleased about it. Ooh, you bad old bear. Oh, give it to me. I called last night. Guess you're over at Judd's? Yeah, I thought about phoning you when I got back, but you know how it is. I can certainly imagine. Sounds like you're enjoying your break from this sideshow. <laughs> Frankly, I'm finding it a bit dull. I miss you, Rachel. A lot. I miss the kids, too. It's mutual, Lewis. You know that. Yeah. How's that paper you're writing? So-so. Mm, I didn't put in the keyboard time yesterday, but I'll make up for it today, honest. Wants a word. All right. Hi, Daddy. Hi, you precious. Dad, I had an awful dream last night. Oh, I'm sorry. About church. Church. Is is he okay? I, I guess so. I I fed him last night, then I put him out. I I haven't seen him this morning, but then I only just woke up. Give him a kiss from me. Oh, yeah. Kiss your own cat, Ellie. <laughs> Liz Creed. Talk to the family yet? Uh, Rachel phoned first thing this morning. Why? Tell them about church. They're getting killed on the road like that? No, I didn't. I thought, uh, uh, you know, that sort of thing comes hard over the phone. I'll be back uh, soon enough, so I'll come... Decision. I wouldn't talk about what we did last night, neither. Not to Rachel, not to anyone. Right. We'll speak about this again. Tonight, maybe, if you stroll over for a beer... By then, you'll understand a lot more. Yeah, Judge... Sorry, Lou, I, I gotta go. Norma wants me to take her into Bucksport. <sighs> oh, my God. Come here, boy. Come here. That's it. I held Church on my lap and probed the fur on his neck. I could remember the sick, boneless way his head had swiveled last night. Now I felt only firm muscle and good tendon. Then I looked at his... at its muzzle. <laughs> Dried blood caked its mouth, and caught in its long whiskers were tiny shreds of green plastic, bits of the hefty bag that I'd buried it in.
Stanley Bouchard told me about the old Micmac burying ground. Stanley B, we used to call him. He was an old man when I was still a boy, more than a little crazy. How did he hear about it? From his dad. Got it from his father. Stanley's grandpa was a fur trapper in the early 1800s, traded with the Micmacs. And they told him their secret? Mm. By that time, they'd abandoned the place because of the Wendigo. Uh, some sort of spirit. Yeah. The Indians believed that if the Wendigo would walk through their village and touch them, gave them a taste for the flesh of their own. Cannibalism? Yeah. Anyhow, one day... When I was ten years old, Stanny B caught me crying my heart out behind the old Bucksport livery stable. The dog Spot was hit by a car the day before he was dying. My dad knew how I loved that dog, so he, he sent me away while he did the deed. I told Stanny, he said he knew a way I could fix it. When I got home, my dad had put a bullet behind Spot's ear. I said I'd bury Spot up at the pet cemetery, but I didn't. I stashed him by the dead fall, like Stanley told me to do. Later, after midnight, I snuck out and met up with Stanley. He was half crocked, and as we walked through the woods, he kept falling down. But when we climbed that dead fall, he stepped steady. He wasn't staggering at all when we passed through Little God Swamp. He'd scared himself sober. So I buried Spot. You can guess the rest. He came back. Next day. First I knew of it was when I heard my mom screaming in the kitchen. Spot had her backed against the icebox. He didn't mean no harm, but there was terror in her eyes. I love my mom. And that took away any joy I might have felt when I saw Spot alive again. My daddy came in then. He took a long look at Spot and said, Give the dog a bath, Judd. He stinks of the ground you buried him in. What'd you do? Gave the mud a bath. I never got rid of that stink. Mm. He always smelled it. He was... He was never right again. Church is the same. Slow and stupid. Damaged. Another beer, Lewis? Yeah, thanks. I could use one. Shooting a man or an animal in the head it isn't as certain as it sounds. There are plenty of would-be suicides walking around. Maybe that's what happened. And your daughter's cat? Church, too. Maybe he was cat just was stunned. Cat was dead. You saw how its head flopped, how cold it was? It was dead, Lewis. Now it's not. Your dad already knew about that burial ground. Yeah. He thought it was a bad place. Said it didn't often do any good for folk who'd lost their animals. Or the animals themselves. He asked if I still liked Spot. And you know, Lewis, I had a hard time answering. So why did you Cause bring... Because kids need to know that sometimes death is better. Your Ellie, she don't know that. Your wife don't know it either. Maybe now they'll learn. They'll go on loving that cat, but they'll breathe a sigh of relief when it finally dies. Judd, I don't know about that. That's How why... That... Oh, but it ain't why. I did it for the same reason Stanny B did it. The reason my daddy would never take me there. I don't understand the you, Judd. The place gets a hold of you. You have to do it. It makes you. My daddy didn't take me to the burying ground because he'd heard about it, but never been. But Stanny had been. So he took me. And 70 years go by and I take you. You was to take your cat out tonight and kill it, Lewis. I'd never say oh, that. Oh, Judd, you're not making sense. Well, I'm all talked out. <sighs> Need another beer, Lewis? No, thanks. I'd better go. One last question. Shoot. Sure. Has anyone ever buried a person up there? Lewis! No! Whoever would! Don't even think about such things. I went back home. I was in the garage fumbling for the light switch when I realized how drunk I was. Oh. The goddamn switch anyway. Oh my 
god. Oh my god, what have I done? Hi, honey. What I'm so I glad to see you. you. Hey, hey, don't break my neck. Hi, Doc. Hey, Rachel. Yeah, it's a gate. Ooh. Oh, boy, you <laughs> You look B, you all right? Uh, Gage threw up on the plane uh, all over awful. me. I don't think it was a virus or anything. I think he was just air sick. Mm. As I was strapping Gage into his car seat, he threw up again. This time I was in line. On the drive home, Rachel sat in the back to comfort Gage, who'd fallen into a fretful doze, and Ellie rode up front with me. Daddy, how's church? I dreamed he got run over. Huh? She had a nightmare. Woke up screaming. Oh, uh, church is fine, honey. As fine as a cat can be when he's come back from the dead. He looks at you with strange, muddy eyes. At night, I put him out with a broom because I can't bear to touch him. And most days, he brings in a mouse or a bird. Or what's left of it. He's, he's, he's just fine. When I had that dream, I was just sure he was dead. Feel him, Louis. Awfully hot. Mm, he's running a fever. Lay him on the couch in the living room. Try not to wake him. Okay. I'll take his temperature. All right. Hi, church. Oh, come on. I watched out of the corner of my eye as Ellie hugged the cat. Her happy face changed slowly to puzzlement. Church lay in her arms, his ears back, his eyes on hers. After a moment, it seemed like a very long moment, Ellie put the cat down. Daddy? What, Ellie? Church smells funny. Does he? Yes, he does. He smells like shit, Daddy. Ellie! A hundred and three? Lou, are you sure? Yes. It is a virus. I'll put him on uh, Tylenol as soon as he wakes up. Bring down the fever. Um, aren't you going to give him antibiotics? They don't touch viruses. They just give him the runs. Are you sure it's a virus? If you want a second opinion, be my guest. You don't have to shout at me. I wasn't shouting. You were. You were. <laughs> Rachel, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> Trip was a strain, huh? Yeah. Oh, and ever since I got home, I've been afraid you'd open the suitcases and hit the roof. Hit the roof? Why? My mom and dad, they bought Ellie and Gage ten new outfits each. Rachel, why? <laughs> why did you let him do that? It was both of them. They're, they're, they're getting old. They love the children. We don't need your father's money. I know you don't like my dad, Lou, but... Mommy! Daddy! Somebody! Uh, I'm here, honey. What is it? Daddy, I don't want Church on the bed. Jeez. He smells so bad. Put him out, Daddy. Put him out! Oh. Would you mind, Lou? Just for tonight. I feel better having Gage with me. It's fine. I'll sleep on the couch. What was Ellie fussing about? Church. She wanted me to take him away. Take him away? That's a switch. Uh, she said he smelled bad and... Well, he was rather fragrant. He must have rolled in something ripe. Too bad. Oh, she loves that cat. Go to sleep, Rachel. My Gage. Mm. Hey. Yeah. I love you, Lou. Glad to be home, and I'm sorry about the couch. We'll make some whoopee tomorrow night, okay? Sure.
By morning, Gage's temperature was normal and he was bright-eyed and full of beans. In a few days, the virus cleared up completely. December was my busiest month yet at the university. As the semester funneled to a close, students crowded into the infirmary with coughs and colds, bronchitis, walking pneumonia, even broken bones from toboggan accidents. At last, the holiday began, and the four of us settled down for an old-fashioned Christmas. On Christmas Eve, after we'd finally got the kids to sleep, Rachel and I sat in the living room by the dying embers of the fire and wrapped the presents. Remember last year? It seemed like everything we got them had to be assembled. I'm past the ribbon. I'm up till four in the morning. <laughs> and by mid-afternoon, Ellie decided the boxes were more fun than the toys. <laughs> <laughs> there, last present. Apart from that bike, how are you doing with it, Chief? I just gotta tighten this and... Ta-da! Lewis? Yeah? What are these screws? Spares. You'd better hope so or she'll break her neck. You gonna wrap it? <laughs> Give me a break, Lou. <laughs> Stick a bow on it and stash it behind the couch. Go on, scat! Get out of here! Strange. That cat's got no grace anymore. When did he lose it? Same time he lost his balls? Maybe. Right. Bed. I'll give you an early present. Woman, that is mine by right. <laughs> <laughs> you wish. Merry Christmas. Now, that present I promised you. Hang on a second, I've got one for you. Hmm? I've been burning a hole in my pocket all night. Merry Christmas, Rachel. Lewis, well, what is it? Um, soap, shampoo, I forget exactly. Tiffany's? Oh. Well, do you like it? Is it a sapphire? That's what the guy told me. Oh, Lewis. <laughs> it's so damn beautiful. Oh, babe, don't do that. <laughs> Lewis, we can't Shh, afford... I've been socking money away all year. It's okay. How much was it? I'll never tell you, Rachel. <laughs> An army of Chinese torturers couldn't get it out of me. Six thousand dollars. Six thousand? <laughs> oh, Lewis, you're crazy. Here, turn around. Let me fasten it. Looks okay. Okay. I'm going to go up and look in the mirror. I want to preen. Mm. I'll put the cat out and lock up. When we make it, Lewis, I want to take everything off except this. Preen quickly. I'll be right up. Church. Church, come on. Where are you? Merry Christmas to you. No, not another bird. You damn cat. Come on. Clear out of here. Yeah. Lewis. You coming up to bed? Uh, I'll be right there. I just gotta clean something up. On New Year's Eve, Judd and Norma came over. Norma seemed frail, as if she'd suddenly aged ten years. And as I watched her drinking Rachel's eggnog, I had a terrible foreboding. When the students came back after the holiday, the flu came with them. The infirmary was busy ten, twelve hours a day. I went home in the evenings utterly whacked, but happy. Then, in late January, in a week of blizzards and sub-zero temperatures, Norma died. Judd. Well, she's gone. Doc Merrill said it was probably a brain embolism. What does, what does that mean? It means she didn't suffer. I wouldn't mind going that way myself. But not just yet, eh? <laughs> it's good, Judd. I don't know what I wanted you to cry. Probably been pissed off with you if you didn't. You should have seen her when she was 16, Lewis. Coming from church with her jacket unbuttoned, her shirt waist so clean and white, your eyes would have popped. 
Get me a beer, will you? Have one yourself. Yeah, sure. A bit early in the day, I know, but... I tell you, Lewis, she was so damn beautiful, she could have made the devil swear off drinking. Well, thank God she never asked me to do it. <laughs> Here you go. To Norma. May she have peace. And wherever she is, let there be no friggin' arthritis. So Judd sat in his kitchen and drank beer and reminisced. A stream of warm memories and anecdotes, colorful and clear, and sometimes arresting. And between telling stories of the past, Judd dealt with the present in a way I could only watch and admire. Could you have someone do her hair, please, Mr. Mortensen? She hadn't washed it since Saturday. A wash and set is all part of the service, Mr. Crandall. Would you like her cosmeticized? Lightly. She's dead. People know it. No need to tot her up. Uh, crackers, another couple of beers, Lou. This is going to take a while. Yeah. And I'd like the coffin closed during the funeral, but open in the chapel of rest. Judd was so composed, so courteous. I felt a great admiration for him then. And love. Yes. And love. That night, when Ellie came downstairs in her pajamas to be kissed, I knew she was going to ask me about Norma Crandall. I also knew Rachel was outside the door listening to what I had to say. Will Mrs. Crandall go to heaven? Um, well, I... I don't really know, honey. Hang on. Come here. People believe all sorts of things about what happens when we die. Some people think we go to heaven or to hell. Some think we're born all over again. Reincarnation? Reincarnation, yes, that's right. <laughs> There's a whole heap of different ideas, Ellie, but no one really knows. People say they do, but what they mean is they believe because of faith. You know what faith is? I guess so. Well, here we are sitting in this armchair. You think it'll be here tomorrow? Yeah, sure. Well, you have faith in that. So do I. Faith is believing a thing will be. Well, we don't know it'll be here. Some crazy chair burglar might break in <laughs> and steal it. Uh, really religious people say that having faith and knowing are the same thing, but I don't think so. Because when it comes to death, there are too many different ideas on the subject. What we know is this. When we die, either some part of us, our soul, I guess, somehow survives. Or not. If it does, all sorts of things are possible. If not, nada. The end. Which do you have faith in, Daddy? I used to think death was the end. But I guess I've changed my mind. I believe we go on. How? I don't know. But I think Mrs. Crandall is probably somewhere she can be happy. You have faith in that? I guess so. I also have faith in the fact that it's your bedtime like 20 minutes ago. <laughs> Night, Dad. Night, Ellie. Sleep tight. Daddy, do you think animals go on? Yes. I do. Remember my dream uh, about Church dying? I remember. If Church died now, Daddy, I could take it. I heard you talking to Ellie about... about death. You don't approve? No. Oh, no, it's not that, Louis. I just... I get scared. Scared of dying? Not myself. Uh, I don't think about that. No, not anymore. As a kid, I thought about it a lot. I, I dreamed that monsters were coming to get me. They all look like my sister Zelda. Zelda? You don't talk about her much. <laughs> oh, Louis, you're sweet. I never talk about her. Well, I guess you've got your reasons. Yeah. She... she died of meningitis, was it? Spinal meningitis. <clears throat> she was two years older than me, and she caught it, and she died in the back room like a... like a dirty secret. A, a dirty secret. Oh, 
<laughs> no, don't stop me, Lewis. I've only got the strength to tell this once. It's really horrible. Yeah. Oh, worse than you could ever imagine. <sighs> we watched her deteriorate day by day. There was nothing anyone could mm. do except give her drugs for the pain. Oh, she was in pain all the time. Her body clenched like a fist. We knew, we knew she was going to die. And the, the truth is we wanted it. We wished her to die, not not just to end her suffering, but to, but to end ours. Because she was becoming a monster. Oh, God, Lewis, that sounds awful. Oh, Rachel, it doesn't. It does, it does. The victims of long illnesses often become demanding and unpleasant. They <laughs> spread their misery. It can't help it. Zelda would piss her bed. She'd say it was an accident, but you, you could see the glee in her eyes. And her, oh, God, her room stank of it. Mm. That and the drugs. Even now... <laughs> I wake up sometimes and I, I smell that room and for a moment I think, is Zelda dead yet? Oh, Rachel. By the end, none of us could remember her the way she used to be. Not even my mother. She was just this foul, hateful, screaming thing in the back room. Our dirty secret. My parents were out when she... Oh. When she finally died. They left you alone? Oh, I mean, it was Passover. They went, they went to see friends. They weren't away long. How old were you? Eight. Jeez. I was downstairs. I, I was trying to read, but I, I couldn't because Zelda was screaming, mm. and I wanted it to stop. And, and then it did suddenly, and I, I knew I knew something was wrong. I ran up to her room and... Zelda was choking like... Rachel, that's uh, enough. No, enough. I'm explaining. I'm explaining why I can't go to Norma's funeral and why we had that stupid fight about that pet cemetery. Shh, come on now. That's all forgotten. No, not by me. I turned Zelda over and I, I thumped her back and she started to convulse. I, I, I knew she was dying and I thought, I thought they'll say I murdered her because, because, Lewis, my first thought when I saw her like that was, oh, good. Zelda's dying at last, and it's going to be over. <laughs> I saw her face go dark and her eyes bulge, and I, I backed away into a wall, and a, a picture fell down. It was, it was from one of the Oz books that Zelda liked, Oz the Great and mm. Terrible, only she couldn't say that. She, she said Oz the Great and Terrible, and it, it smashed, and I ran out of the room screaming, Zelda's dead! Zelda's dead! Zelda's dead! I was hiding in the garden when the neighbors came. They thought I was crying. But I wasn't crying, Louis. I wasn't. I was laughing. I was laughing. Good. Good for you. No, you don't mean that. I do. If I needed another reason to really dislike your mother and father, I've got it now. You should have never been left alone with her, Rachel. Never. <laughs> Get you a volume. No, Lewis, you know I don't. Tonight you do. When the pill had taken hold, Rachel told me the rest. How for years she believed Zelda would seek revenge from beyond the grave. How she'd had nightmares. How she hadn't attended Zelda's funeral or any funeral since. I feel better, you know. Like I've just sicked up something that's been poisoning me for years. I guess you have. So you won't be mad at me if if I'm ill on the day they bury Norma? No, I won't be mad. But can I take Ellie? Lewis. Okay. If, if you think it won't hurt her. Oh, death, where is thy sting? Oh, grave, where is thy victory? Thanks be to God who gives us victory over death. Judd looks son, weird in that suit. Hashani. Will the pallbearers come forward? <clears throat> Excuse me. Daddy. 
Where are you going? I'm one of the pallbearers, honey. I I'm going to help carry Norma out. Where will I find you? Go out on the steps. I'll meet you there. J just don't forget me. I won't. Daddy. What, babe? J don't drop her. <laughs> Lou, coming to bed? Yeah, I'll just finish up here. How was Ellie tonight? She had a little cry. Mm. She said Norma made the best oatmeal cookies ever, and now she won't be making them anymore. Uh, she's right. <laughs> I promised to make some with her tomorrow. That cheered her up. She's asleep now. Good. Lou, would you come up? I, j I know you're working, but... No, 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 no. Hang on just a second. I go. Time rolled by, another spring. I remember the date, March 24th, the last really happy day of my life. The things that were to come, poised above us like a killing weight, were still over six weeks in the future. Days that are truly good, all the way through, are very rare. God in his infinite wisdom is a lot more generous in doling out pain. It was Saturday. Rachel and Ellie had gone to Bucksport with Judd, who liked the company, and I was home minding Gage. The kid had woken from his nap, scratchy and out of sorts. I tried to amuse him without success. When I heard the wind gusting around the house and suddenly remembered the kite I'd bought on a whim a few weeks before. Oh, Daddy! Hey, how about that? Got it up first shot. It's flying it! <laughs> Fly higher, fly yeah. higher. Yeah, woo! Yeah. <laughs> the kite soared into the blue. As it rose higher, 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 I felt myself go up, go into it, until I was staring down on the world, as cartographers must see it in their dreams. The field was a rectangle, white and still after the snow. Below it, I could see the dark strip of the road, and beyond that, the river, cold gray band of steel. Gage? What? You're flying it now. You're at the controls, my man. It's your kite. Gage, fly it. Yeah, that's right. Pull the string. That's it. Hey, look at his swoop. Yay. Pull the string. It was a moment with Gage I never forgot. Just as I'd gone up into the kite, now I felt myself go down into my son until I was in Gage's tiny house, looking out of the windows that were his eyes at a world that was huge and bright, where Vinton's field was as big as a prairie, and a kite soared miles above me. I love you, Gage. I love you, Daddy. And Gage, who now had less than two months to live, tugged at the string that was drumming in his fist, and made the kite swoop and dive. experience. There's no limit to the horror the human mind can apprehend. 
When the nightmare grows dark enough, horror spawns horror. Coincidental evils beget other, deliberate ones until at last, darkness covers everything. The interesting question is how much of this can a man stand and stay sane? But I didn't think about any of this at the time, by which I mean at the time of my son's death. Gage William Creed. During those few days leading up to the funeral, I didn't think about anything much. I just replayed the accident in my head over and over. Gage, stop! Stay there! Gotcha! You must never run in the road. Never. You do that again and I swear I'll put you over my knee. You gave us such a fright. But that ain't how it was. Gage was too quick. Lewis was too far away. That old Orinco truck was too big, too fast. That damn road. That damn road. I made the arrangements for the funeral, like I had for Norma a few months before. Lewis came with me to pick out the coffin. The American Casket Company's Rosewood model, Eternal Rest. It's a beautiful casket. Yes. I'm afraid we only have the pink silk lining, Dr. Creed. It should be blue, of course. Doesn't matter, Mr. Mortensen. My wife and I have never made such distinctions. The morning before the funeral, I was minding Ellie in the Creed's kitchen, watching the poor kid push her mark around the Monopoly board. She held onto a photograph taken last winter, her pulling Gage on a sled, both of them laughing. Rachel was out of it that day, house coat buttoned wrong, hair a mess. Lewis looked okay in his dark suit and tie, but he was lost in shock. Steve Masterton, Lou's buddy from work, was there too, thank God. I told you before, Mr. Goldman, Rachel needs a little more time. More time. So maybe this afternoon, if the tranquilizers I kick in... son-in-law's behind this, keeping my daughter Mr. Away from Goldman, me. Rachel is my patient now, and I'm doing what I think is best for her. Sorry. Right now, she needs to be left alone. You schmuck! <sighs> Father-in-law from hell again. <sighs> How's it going, Mr. Crandall? Pretty terrible. Three and five. Boardwalk. Your throw, Ellie. I'm worried about Lewis. Could you have a word before he leaves for the funeral home? If I think Rachel can handle it, I'll, uh, I'll bring her in this afternoon. Uh huh. Mr. Crandall will stay with Ellie. I touched his jacket, Steve. What? I swear I did. But by then he couldn't stop, and the truck was going so Ooh, fast. get a hold of yourself. Right. I, I don't think you've noticed, but Ellie isn't vocalizing. And Rachel's in such bad shock, she's I lost all sense of time. I can't didn't fall down when little kids run fast like that. They always Ooh, fall down. they need you now. Please, man. I can give your wife a shot, but... Oh, what a mess. What a damn mess. You gotta go now, Steve. I'll be late for the viewing. Yeah, viewing. That's what Mr. Mortensen called it. Not really a viewing, of course, because of the closed coffin. But if it was open, they'd all run screaming from the room. Oh, Lois, I'm so sorry. Such a Dear, sweet little boy. Missy, thank you for coming. It's an awful road, Lewis. That truck driver was going far too fast. I hope they put him in jail. Why would God take Gage? I don't know. Where's Rachel? Resting. She'll be along later. Thank God he didn't suffer, Lewis. At least it was quick. Oh, yeah, it was quick, all right. 
five seconds for that truck to drag Gage the length of a football field as I ran after him, screaming his name. On the 25-yard line, there was his Red Sox cap. 50-yard line, one of his Spider-Man sneakers. 75-yard line, his sweater turned inside out. Then there was Gage. Lewis? Lewis? Lewis, are you all right? Uh, yeah. Fine. Fine, Missy. Uh, don't forget to sign the book for Rachel. Be well, Lewis. Missy hurried on down the aisle for the ritual examination of the coffin. Then the rest came, moving in a shuffling line. And I received them. Their handshakes, hugs, tears. Collar and sleeve of my jacket got quite damp. He's with the angels in his whole life ahead of him. God moves in mysterious ways. Thank God he didn't suffer. Mercifully, he didn't suffer. He didn't suffer. He didn't suffer. I was told it was merciful Gage hadn't suffered 32 times. God works in mysterious ways, 25. He's with the angels now a mere 12 times. By the time my parents-in-law appeared, I felt like a boxer at the end of a long, hard fight. I thought how old they looked. And I decided it was time to let bygones be bygones. Erwin, Dory, I know things have been difficult between us, but let's put that behind us now. You're right, Lewis. Gage would have wanted Don't to speak to him, Dory. Come on. Erwin, Dory, please. I warned Rachel about you. Dr. Creed, telephone. How you doing? Coping. Is Rachel coming in? Yeah. She seems a little better. Uh, how about we meet for lunch? Sure, Steve. What's a good restaurant for halftime between funeral viewings? Hey, take it easy. Um, how about Benjamin's? Mm, Benjamin's sounds fine. Your mom and dad were in. I hardly spoke to them. Can I get another beer here, please? Coming right up. Steve? Uh, no thanks. I've had enough. I'm going to give his clothes to the Salvation Army. <sighs> Rachel. Now, there's a lot of wear on them yet. Someone will be glad of them. Except for the ones he was wearing. Of course they yeah, that's right. Oh. Oh. Lewis. Oh. Lewis, for pity's sake. Oh. It's okay, Rachel. Oh. It's okay. I sat there and watched Steve take my wife in his arms and hug her gently. I could see he was angry with me, and I knew what I ought to do. But I just couldn't comfort her. That afternoon, Rachel received the mourners while I sat in the front row near the coffin. I was so tired. My mind started to shut down. I knew something like this would happen. I said when she married you, Erwin, you'll have all the grief you can stand, I said to her, and more. Now look at this mess. What, what are you talking I about? I told Rachel this is what it gets you, marrying against your father's wishes. No, not even you would you say that. You prancing little fraud of a You're doctor. You're drunk, you stink you of whiskey. You my daughter into marriage, turned her into a scullery maid, and then let her son be run down on the highway like... Like a tip You said that to Rachel. You, you said that. My grandson die a dirty death on a country road. You bastard! Oh, 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 Lewis, no, no, don't hit me. You're like a hit old All right, man. Just, just, just leave it alone. alone. Just, just leave it alone. No. 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 Gage's coffin fell on its lid, so it didn't actually open and spill out his sad, hurt remains. We were spared that at least. Sitting there on the floor, bleeding onto the broken vases and crushed flowers, I began to weep. Beside me, Erwin Goldman was weeping too. Rachel was led out by her mother, still screaming. Later, she became very quiet. When I got her home, I sedated her and put her to bed. Try to sleep now. I'm sorry, Rachel. I'd give anything in the world for that not to have happened. 
Doesn't matter. You put Ellie to bed? Of course. How bad are you? Pretty bad, Louis. Pretty damn terrible. You don't want to sleep with Mommy tonight? No. You sure? Yeah, she steals the covers. I want you to know, Ellie, that if we keep on loving each other, we can get through this. I'm going to wish really hard. I'm going to pray to God for Gage to come back. Come on, Ellie. God doesn't bring people... God can bring Gage back if he wants to. God can do anything. God doesn't do things like that. He does so. In Sunday school, the teacher told us about this guy, Lazarus. He was dead, and Jesus brought him back to life. He said, Lazarus, come forth. Ellie, that's just... That was a long time ago. I'm going to keep things ready for Gage. I'm going to carry his picture and sit in his chair and, you know, get things ready. In case. It makes a kind of crazed sense. Keep the lines open. Keep Gage in the hot 100. Remember when Gage did this or that? Yeah, good old Gage. What a kid. Because a day will come, Ellie. Maybe soon when you'll forget to carry his picture. And I'll see it lying in this empty room while you ride your bike or watch television or go out to play with a friend. When Gage becomes something that happened once. A blast from the past. Ellie, don't cry anymore. This isn't forever. Ellie fell asleep before her tears stopped. I left her bedroom and stood at the head of the stairs. I knew what I needed. I needed to get drunk. I got nothing for you. Go kill a bird. You don't even eat them, do you? Just killing them is enough for you. Uh, to my son, my late son, Gage William Creed, who might have been an artist or an Olympic swimmer, the goddamn president of the United States. Hey, Frankencat, get lost! buried a person up there. Louis, no! Whoever would! When are you gonna do it, Louis, my man? When are you gonna take Gage up to the woods? Never. You must not go beyond this, no matter how much you feel the need. Makes perfect sense. Gage was killed on the road just like Church. Now Church has come back. Not right, he's not... What, Ellie? Church smells funny. He's not... Church anymore. Okay, he's a bit ripe. He kills a few birds. <laughs> a few birds, jeez. Ellie still loves him. He's still part of the family. No, I won't go down that road. That's insanity. There is more power here than you can understand. It is old and always restless. Remember this. God can do anything. In Sunday school, teacher told us about this guy, Lazarus. He was dead, and Jesus brought him back to life. Yeah, Lou. But would it work? Can I come inside, Louis? Tell you what, John. It's very late, and I've just drunk a pile of beer. Yeah, I, I can smell it. You gonna let me in or not? Well, since you put it like that. Hey, you're in luck. Still a few left. Right. Thanks. Okay. What are you doing over here at quarter past midnight on the morning my son gets buried? You're a good friend, Judd, but this is pushing it. Sit down, Louis. Tell me you're not thinking of taking him up there. To the Micmac burying ground. I wasn't thinking about anything but going to bed. How far does the influence of that place extend, you know? Shut I really don't I see... don't. And I've lived my whole life in this patch of the world. 
That place was holy to the Micmacs, but not in a good way. Stanny B. told me that. So did my dad. That's why I came over here tonight to tell you about Timmy Baderman. Who's Timmy Baderman? Timmy was one of 20 or so Ludlow boys. Went to fight Hitler in 42. Came back in a box with old glory on top in 43. His daddy, Bill Baderman, went crazy when he got the telegram. Then he quieted right down. He knew about the Micmac burying ground, see? Why didn't you tell me this before, Judd? After we... After we did the cat... You didn't need to know then. Now you do. I knew I'd got to talk to you about this when Mortensen down to the funeral home told me you'd ordered a grave liner instead of a ceiling vault. You've been snooping on me, Judd. I'm sorry for that. You once told me your uncle was an undertaker, said you worked for him one so summer. So what? So you know, it takes a crane and a gang of navvies to open a ceiling vault, but a grave liner... One guy with a pick and shovel could do it, if he was determined. Judd, it's late. I'm drunk and my heart aches. If you have to tell me a story, then tell it. Just get it over with. Timmy Baderman was shot dead on the road to Rome on July 15th, 1943. His body was shipped home two days later and put onto a mystery train with a dozen mystery others. Mystery train? That's what they called those funeral trains. This one went all over the state. Bangor, Derry, Orrington, finally Ludlow where Bill Baderman was waiting. Timmy was buried in Pleasant View Cemetery two days later with full military honors. Half of Ludlow was there. That would be July 22nd. Four days after that, Marjorie Washburn, the mayor woman in those days, saw Timmy walking along the Peterson Road. Marge went straight back to the post office, tossed a bag of undelivered mail across George Anson's desk. Marge? What's the matter? You look as white as a bone. I don't want to talk about it. Are you sick? I said I don't want to talk about it. She didn't either. Not till 20 years had passed, and she was dying. I knew he was dead. Hell, I'd been to his funeral. Then there he was, walking, lurching up the Peterson Road, dead pale, eyes like raisins in bread dough, wearing an old army greatcoat, though it must have been 90 in the shade. I saw a ghost that day. Pretty soon, others saw Timmy. Mrs. Stratton was one. She had a house on the Peterson Road. She'd play her jazz records for you and throw a little party if you had a ten-dollar bill that wasn't working too hard. She saw Timmy from her porch. He stood there at the edge of the road, hands dangling, chin pushed out. My heart was going like 60. I was too scared to move. Then he turned and looked at me, and his eyes, they were like dusty marbles. And he grinned. Still got your jazz records, Mrs. Stratton. Because I wouldn't mind cutting a rug with you. Maybe this very night. Mrs. Stratton went inside, didn't come out for a week. By which time it was all over. You saw him, didn't you? Yeah, I saw him. What was he like? Ever see one of them zombie movies, Lewis? Where the creatures shamble along, dead eyes staring, sort of slow, clumsy? Just like that? He was. But he wasn't, because there was something behind those eyes, something nasty and sly. It wasn't quite thinking. And I don't believe it had much to do with Timmy Baderman. It was more like, like, like a radio signal coming from somewhere else. Anyhow, back and forth he went along that road. Until at last, a few of us got together. Me, George Anson, the postmaster, Hannibal Benson, our second selectman. We decided to go up to Bill Baderman's place and get that abomination taken care of. I'll never forget that night. It was hotter than hell, with the setting sun making the sky look like a bucket of guts. We drove over in Hannibal Benson's car. We were scared, Lewis. 
When we got there, Hannibal knocked. No one answered, so we went round the back. And there they were. Bill Bateman was sitting on his stoop with a pitcher of beer. Timmy was in the yard, staring up at that blood-red sun. Bill, he was floating in his clothes, must have lost 40 pounds. His eyes were sunk. Lewis, he looked damned. Hey, I didn't hear your boys knock. That's a barefaced lie. I knocked loud enough to wake, to wake up a deaf man. Bill, I heard your boy was killed over in Italy. Well, that was a mistake. The War Department don't think so. You see him standing right over there, don't you? So who'd you reckon was in that coffin you had buried out at Pleasant View? Damn, do I know. And damned if I care. The War Department... Let that damn War Department rot in hell. Timmy, Timmy come home the other day. He's shell-shocked or something. He's a little strange now, but he'll come around. Quit it, Bill. We all know you've been fooling around in the woods north of Route 15. You've caused yourself and this town a heap of trouble. When I got that telegram, life just ran out of me like piss down my leg. He was 18. All I had left of his dear mother, and now I got him back. So screw the Army and the War Department and the U.S. of A. And screw you boys, too. He's shaking. His mouth is going tick, tick, tick. There's sweat all over him. And that's when I realized he's crazy. You okay, Lou? I feel sick to my stomach. So what did you do about Timmy Baderman? Not a lot we could do. Hannibal said... God help you, Bill. We got ready to go. That's when Timmy came over. Hell, he even walked wrong, Lewis, like a like an old, old man. And he stank. A black smell, like like everything inside him was spoiled. He expected to see maggots okay, squirming. Stop. In. Please, Judd, I've heard enough. That's it, you ain't. And I can't tell it as bad as it was. He was dead, Lewis. But he was alive, too, and he, he knew things. Knew things? What sort of things? Timmy looked at Hannibal Benson, sort of grinned, showed his teeth anyway, then he, he leaned forward like he had a special secret to tell. H Hannibal couldn't move. He was like a, like a, a, a raccoon caught in headlights. Got some news about your wife, Benson. Your young, sweet, innocent wife is screwing that man she works with down at the drugstore. No. No! <laughs> what do you think of that? What do you think of that? Shut up! <laughs> Shut up or I'll knock you down! <laughs> Whatever you are! <laughs> and you, old man Anderson, that grandson you set such store by is just willing you to die. You want to know what he calls you? Old wooden leg. No. What do you think of that? <laughs> but my, won't he spit when he finds all the money he's waiting for has been spent on gambling. Every red cent. What do you think of that? My God. <laughs> How did you... Timmy! Oh my God. Stop it. You stop it now. Timmy wouldn't stop. He went on. Said something bad about me, too. He, he, he was raving by then, pouring out all that nastiness and bile. What we saw, it was pure evil, Lewis. We backed off and then we ran. George had half fainted. We had to carry him. <sighs> Last I saw of Timmy Bateman, he was on that back porch, face all red in the setting sun, those terrible marks standing out, laughing and, and, and screeching. Cuckold! Beggar! Whore master! Cuckold! Beggar! Whore master! <laughs> Goodbye, gentlemen! Goodbye! Those things Timmy said, were they true? I don't rightly know. What about the thing Timmy Baderman said about you? It was true. Christ, it was true. I... I used to go to a whorehouse in Bangor sometimes. I'd, I'd just get the urge, the compulsion. Norbert wouldn't have left me if she'd known, but something in her would have died forever. 
something dear and sweet. Take it easy, John. Timmy told us the bad, only the bad. God knows, Lou, we've all got some of that in us. But there was good in those men, too. It showed us the bad because it was bad and he knew we hated it. Timmy Baderman had been a nice, ordinary kid, but what we saw that night, that was a monster, Louis. And the Micmacs would have known what it was. And what's that? Something touched by the Wendigo. So how did it all come out? There was a fire at the Baderman place two nights later, burned flat. They both burned up? They burned, yeah. But they was dead beforehand. Timmy was shot twice in the chest with Bill Baderman's old colt, which they found in Bill's hand. Seemed like Bill killed his boy, spread the kerosene around, they flicked the match, ate the barrel of his forty-five. Oh, jeez. They were both well charred, but the county medical examiner said it looked like Timmy had been dead two or three weeks. The Micmacs didn't make that place the way it is, Lewis. It was there when they came here, maybe two thousand years ago. Now they're gone, it's there still, and someday will be gone. The, 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 the evil will go on. So why'd you take me there, Judd? I was too weak to resist. The place has power. I'm scared it used me to get at you through your son. You see what I'm getting at, Lewis? You're saying the place knew Gage was gonna die? No, I'm saying the place might have made Gage die because I took you there. I'm saying I might have murdered your son, Lewis. No. I don't believe it. Well, the hour's late, Lewis. I've talked nine times more than I meant to. I doubt that. You've been very eloquent, Judd. We're burying Gage in Banger, and in Banger he'll stay. I don't plan to go to the pet cemetery or beyond it ever again. Promise me, Lewis. Promise. For Gage's sake. I promise. For Gage's sake. must never, never run in the road. Never. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy Seven years old already? I can hardly Gage. believe it. Uh, seems like only yesterday was in diapers. Okay, Gage. Take a big breath. Take your starting positions. When did he get so tall? <laughs> State swimming mind. champion. Scholarship to Johns Hopkins. <laughs> And through it all, he's still the same sweet Gage. And so, Gage William Creed, who celebrated his 19th birthday earlier this month, steps onto the podium to accept the first gold medal for cool. America of these Olympics. I feel so proud. Oh, Lewis, <laughs> I never thought. That afternoon, all those years ago, when I raced that Orenko truck for Gage's life, he was stepping up on that podium. No birthdays. No college. No Olympics. No gauge. Suffer little children to come unto me and forbid them not, for such is the kingdom of God. 
We buried Gage at two o'clock that afternoon with a short graveside service. My father-in-law stood opposite me across the grave, avoiding my eyes. He looked utterly lost and more like a wino than ever. Now let us all bow our heads for a moment of silent prayer. It takes a crane and a gang of navvies to open a ceiling vault, but a grave liner. One guy with a pick and shovel could do it, if he was determined. No. No, I won't think of that. Good service. You okay, Louis? Just about. How are you, Rachel? I'm all right. Thank you, Chad. And how about you, my dear one? How are you getting along? I'm fine. Thank you, Mr. Crandall. Can I see that photo you got there, Ellie? Please? All right. Must have been darn hard work for you, pulling that sled. <laughs> I can see Gage liked it, though, didn't he? Yes, he did. He liked it a lot. Judd, please. No, Rachel. I'd pull him, and he'd laugh and laugh. Yeah. Then we'd go inside. And Mommy would fix us some cocoa. Remember that, Mommy? Yes. I bet that was a good time, all right. Here. You keep this safe. Your little brother may be dead now, Ellie, but you still got your good memories of him. Yes, I have. I love Gage, Mr. Crandall. I know you did, my dear. See you back at the house. At the gathering afterwards... Rachel broke down only once, and her mother was there to comfort her. Ellie did the rounds with a tray of canapes, the photo of Gage tucked firmly under her arm. That evening, clouds rolled in, and a strong west wind started to blow. Rachel was in the kitchen stacking the dishwasher. What are you looking for, Lou? Car keys. Take mine. Thanks. Where are you going? Thought I'd pick up a pizza. Didn't you eat earlier? I wasn't hungry then. I might try a word of banger. You want anything? One pepperoni with mushrooms. Any side orders with that, Doc? Uh, no, thanks. We're real busy right now, so it'll be uh, 45 minutes. Okay for you? Yeah, sure. I'll, uh, I'll come back around 9. Uh, Doc, I saw in the paper about your little boy. I'm real sorry. As I left the pizzeria, it suddenly occurred to me that I was in walking distance of Pleasant View, where Gage was buried. I had time to kill... All these little plots in their neat, regular rows. Real estate for sale. One-room apartments. No headstone yet. Just a neat rectangle of bare earth. With gauge underneath it. It's dark. The gate's unlocked. You could easily come back here with a pick and oh, shovel. Yeah, and be charged with vandalism, grave robbing, lose my job? You're talking about jobs? You could bring Gage back. Your son could live again. I'm supposed to believe that? You've seen church? And you believe Judd's story about Timmy Baderman? Including the part about Timmy Baderman being transformed into some sort of all-knowing demon? You don't really believe that. Okay. Say Judd was exaggerating that. Think of church now. Nasty, graceless, muddled... That day with the kite. Remember how vibrant and alive Gage was? Oh, Daddy! Hey, hey, how about that? Higher, higher, yeah. Higher, higher. yeah! Yeah! Woo! <laughs> Isn't it best to remember Gage like that? Or do you want my son to be a zombie from a grade B horror picture? So what if Gage is... diminished? You'll still love him? So would Rachel and Ellie? And as for everyone else, well, they can just go to hell. They can all go to hell. Hey, you, 
what you doing there? Who are you? I'm caretaker of this boneyard. More to the point, bud. Who are you? And what are you up to? This place is off limits after dark, don't you know that? I'm, I'm sorry, no, I didn't. Could you shine your flashlight down, please? I, I, I can't see. Get up, mister. Let's take a look at you. You by yourself? Yes. What you been doing with that grave? That's a little boy's grave. I know. The little boy was my son. Oh, oh God, sir. I should have realized I'm so sorry. No, 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 it's, it's fine. I didn't mean what I said, you know. We got winos breaking in here. And... <laughs> he thought I was one. Yeah, I can see how you might. I got a little grandson myself, three years old. Oh, must be like a goddamn nightmare. That just about says it. Come along, sir. I'll walk you to the gate. So, what time you punch out of here? I get off here at 11. There's no one here all night, then? Isn't that risky? I mean, you said there were drunks. Plenty of cop cars patrolling this neighborhood. They keep an eye on things. Oh, good. That's good. Don't you worry, sir. Your little boy rests safely here till the end of time. Baderman had been dead for 10, 12 days before his father could get him up to the burial ground. Maybe that's why it all went wrong. Gage has been dead for four already, but I could cut the time in half if... If only the circumstances were right. It was easy with church because the family were away. Because the family were away in Chicago. You want us to what? Fly back with your mom and dad when they go home tomorrow. Lewis, are you out of your mind? After the fight you had with my father? That's one reason I want you to go. It's time we healed that wound. But, Lewis, Chicago. I, I, I don't think it's a good idea. Ellie and I need you now. I hope you need us. I do. I do. V both of you very much. So let's stay here. We'll face this together. Of course. We, we, we've got to do that. Well, then why? First, we need time to recover. Honey... Right now, this house is the most painful place in the world for you. Gage is everywhere. You're right. It hits me all the time. I moved the couch while you were out. I thought cleaning would take my mind off things. Mm. There were four of Gage's little matchbox cars under there. We were waiting for him to come back and play with them. Oh, Lewis. <laughs> Hold me, uh, please. That's what I mean. That's exactly what I mean. If only we could get him back. Right. Lewis, I'd watch him better. I swear. Oh, I read in the paper that he tried to commit suicide. Who, who did? The truck driver. He tried to hang himself in his garage. I'm too bad he failed. Oh. No, the paper said he was in deep shock and depression. Oh, yeah, but it'll pass when some judge gives him a slap on the wrist fine. No, it's weird, Lewis. He wasn't drunk or on drugs. He'd never been caught speeding before. He said when he got to Ludlow, he just felt like putting the pedal to the metal. He didn't even know why. There is more power here than you can understand. I'm saying the place might have made Gage die because I took him there. Lewis, are you okay? Fine. You look feverish, like you're coming down uh, with something. You and Ellie shouldn't be in this house, Rachel. Not another day. Call your mom and dad. Do it now. I'll follow you in three days, four at the most. Well, why not come with us? I need to find someone to cover for me. Lewis. What? What are you hiding? Hiding? I, I don't know what you mean. Don't you? No, I don't. Never mind. I'll call my parents, Lewis, if that's what you really want. Yes, it is. The Goldmans were overjoyed at my suggestion, and Rachel managed to get two cancellations on a flight that got to Chicago just a couple of hours after her parents. She went upstairs to pack. I'll get it. Lewis Creed. Lewis, this is Irwin. 
I'll call Rachel. No. I phoned to talk to you, Lewis. Dory wanted me to call and apologize. And I guess... I guess I want to apologize, too. There's no need. What I did at the funeral home was shameful. Well, Mr. Goldman, that was an emotional day for all of us. It was a terrible day. Thanks to me. A stupid, pig-headed old man. I hurt my daughter when she needed my help. I hurt you Mr. when Mr. Goldman, you were please. There's no need. Rachel probably told you we had another daughter. Uh, Zelda. Yes, she told me about Zelda. It was so difficult. Most of all for Rachel, I think. She was there when Zelda died. I heard about that. But it was hard for Dory and me, too. Dory almost had a breakdown. Did she? And ever since, we've clung to Rachel. Tried to protect her. To make up for not being there. Please, we... Mr. Goldman. Er Irwin. No more. I, I can't take any more. Let me apologize, Lewis, please. That's what I called to do. Suddenly I had this great idea. I'd let Gage lie in his Pleasant View grave. Instead of opening a door that had closed, I'd lock it and throw away the key. I'd do exactly what I told Rachel I was going to do. Tidy up here and fly to Chicago. Spend summer there with Rachel and Ellie. In mid-August, we'd come home and start afresh... Begin weaving our lives again from new thread. Would you help me shut the lid? Let's hope it doesn't spring open in the baggage hold. I'll take it downstairs. Lewis. What? Are you sure there's nothing you want to tell me? Oh, God's sake, hon. What do you think I'm going to do? Creep off to a bordello, join the circus? What? I don't know, but this feels wrong. It's... Like you're trying to get rid of us. Rachel, that's ridiculous. You were never a good liar, Lou. Why would I lie? Ellie dreamed you were dead last night. Did she? She woke up crying. I went to her. She dreamed you were sitting at the kitchen table. Your eyes were open, but she knew you were dead. She said she could hear fire engines and smell burning. Steve Masterton was screaming. Her brother just died, all right? It's normal yeah, to dream yeah, that Yeah, yeah, I other worked that out for members... myself. But the way she told it, it was like... It was like a prophecy. <sighs> or maybe you had to be there. Uh, yeah, maybe so. Come with us, Lewis. I'm afraid. I... I've been having dreams of my own. About what? Zelda. She's coming to get me. She engaged for letting them both die. Rachel, that's just... I a... know, just a dream. Take the suitcase down and come to bed with me, Lewis. Keep the dreams away, if you can. scare we had with Gage when he was nine months old? Oh, God, yeah. The cat scan. And that terrible wait in the hospital. I remember the whole thing like it was yesterday. Why? Well, if things had turned out differently, if it hadn't been a false alarm, could you still have loved him? What a weird question, Lewis. No, could you? Yes, of course. I'd have loved Gage no matter what. Even if he was retarded? Damaged? Yeah. Lewis, why are you asking me this now? I... I guess I was just thinking about Zelda. Let's go to sleep. You gotta be up early to catch that plane. I'll check the bags. Okay, hon. So, Ellie, you think you're going to have a good time in Chicago? No. No? Why not? Well, last night, I dreamed we were at Gage's funeral, and the funeral man opened his coffin, and it was empty. Then I was at home, and I looked in Gage's bed, and that was empty, too. But there was... there was dirt in it. Well, they're just dreams, Ellie, 
just dreams. I wish you were coming with us, or that we were staying here. Can we stay, Daddy, please? I don't want to go to Grandma and Granddad's. I just want to go home. Please, Daddy, please. It's only for a little while, Ellie. I've got things to do here. Then I'll be with you, and we'll all be together. As I left the airport, I knew for the first time with absolute certainty that I was going to go through with it. I was going to resurrect my son. I drove across the Penobscot Bridge into Brewer and parked outside Watson's Hardware. Can I help you, sir? I'd like a flashlight. Biggest you've got. And uh, something to hood it with. Oh, going to jacklight a few deer tonight. I've, uh, I've, I've got a septic tank to dig up. Seems I'm in violation of the zoning ordinances. If I'm caught, it'll mean a hefty fine. <laughs> I see. Uh, you could hood this with a piece of felt. I poke a hole in it. It'll oh. cut down the beam. Uh, can you sell me the felt? Sure. I also need a pick and a shovel. Four yards of rope and uh, a canvas tarpaulin. Say, eight by eight. It wouldn't be dark for hours, but I couldn't go home in case I met Judd. If he saw I was alone, he'd be suspicious. So I drove back to Bangor and checked into a motor lodge not far from the Pleasant View Cemetery. No luggage, Mr. Uh, Mr. Cobain? Oh, I've got luggage. Right now it's on the plane to New York. Damn baggage handlers. Oh, no. As I lay back on the bed in that anonymous motel room... I felt unplugged from everyone and everything that was dear and familiar to me. Family, friends, work. I closed my eyes and the faces loomed. Rachel, Judd, Ellie, Steve. And suddenly a bizarre thought struck me. Before I saw any of those faces again, I would see the face of my son. Help me, his cage. Ellie, 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 wake up. Come on, Mommy's here. He's, he's alive. Ellie. Got the knife from Daddy's bag. Ellie. Anything I can do, ma'am? No, no, I don't think so. She's just having a bad dream. Don't let him get Daddy. Hey. Don't let him get Daddy. Ellie, 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 it's okay. You're with me. Come on, you're on the plane. We'll soon be in Chicago. You're safe, Ellie. Oh, Ellie, you're safe. I lay there and went over the plan in my mind. I studied it from all angles. Okay. Tonight, sometime after 11, I break into Pleasant View Cemetery and dig up the grave. I raise the grave liner, remove Gage's body from his coffin, wrap it in the tarp, and drive home and take a long walk in the woods. What about after, when Gage comes back? He returns. A little slow, maybe. He might be okay, just as he was. It's possible. But still Gage, your son, Ellie's brother. But what if... Some sort of monster comes back. What then? And you'll... You'll make a diagnosis. You're a doctor, for God's sake. You'll judge your ability to reintegrate Gage into the family based on what you see over, say, 24 hours. Yeah, and if I don't like what I see? Huh? If Gage comes back like Timmy Baderman? Then you'll kill him. Kill Gage! It wouldn't be Gage. It'd be like destroying a rat-carrying plague. You'll give him... It... A shot of morphine. Take the body back to Pleasant View, rebury it, fly out to Chicago. No one will ever know. But it won't be like that. You know it won't. Gage will still be Gage. Suppose that's true. Gage passes his exam. What then? You'll leave Ludlow together, empty every bank account you have, fly somewhere. Florida, maybe. Check into a motel. Then you'll call Rachel. Don't ask. Just bring Ellie and come. Now, this minute. You'll be waiting in the motel room. Rachel and Ellie will arrive in a rented car. Louis! Louis, are you there? Daddy, we're here, we're here! You'll bring Gage to the door, throw it open, and... But no matter how hard I tried, I couldn't imagine what came next. So I went over the plan one more time. Do you feel better now, honey? Oh, really? Ellie, what's wrong? Can you tell me? I, I don't know, but something's wrong. Something with Daddy. 
It was in my dream about Gage. It was a church. Tell me about your dream. I was in the pet cemetery. Pack Scout took me there. He said Daddy was going to go there and something terrible would happen. You, you dream someone named Pack Scout took you to the pet cemetery? He said that was his name, and. Oh. What? He said he was sent to warn, but he couldn't interfere. He was helping Daddy because they were together when... when oh, oh, Mommy, I can't remember. Oh, Ellie, Ellie, I I'm sure Daddy is fine. I think you dreamed about the pet cemetery because you're thinking about Gage. Do you feel any better now? No, I I'm scared. Aren't you scared, Mommy? Come on. Let's go and find Grandma and Granda. She looks so pale, poor dear. It's nervous exhaustion. Mm. He was wearing shorts. Who was, honey? Pax Cow. He was wearing jogging shorts. He was just a freshman, Victor Pascal. Jogging on campus in a car plowed in. Paxcow. Ellie, the man in your dream, did he tell you his first name? Mommy, are you all Did right? he tell you his first name? Yes, Victor. His name was Victor. Mommy, did you dream him too? No, Paxcow, Ellie, Pascal. Pascal, that's it? Well, what's going on here? I don't know. Rachel, what is it? Is something the matter with Ellie? No, it's not Ellie, Dad. It's, it's Lewis, I think. Something's wrong or something's going to be wrong. Would you stay with Ellie? I've got to call home. Rachel, who's this Pascal Ellie keeps talking about? He was the about? student who was killed last year on Lewis's first day. Hmm. How does Ellie know about it? She doesn't. Not from us, anyway. I kept it from her. Maybe she heard the name on the radio or at school. Damn. Damn! Lewis isn't home. Mm -hmm. Would you go back to Mom and Ellie, Dad, please? Judd Crandall speaking. Judd, have you seen Lewis today? Can't say I have, Rachel. Why do you ask? No, it may be nothing, but Ellie had a dream on the plane. Plane? I... Rachel, where are you? Chicago. Ellie and Chica I came back with my parents. L Lewis didn't go with you? He's going to join us later. Was it his idea that you should leave? Yes. Oh. Yes, it was, Judd. What's wrong? Something is wrong, isn't it? Judd, tell me, please. First... You tell me about your daughter's dream. When Rachel and I were done, I crossed over to Lewis's house. I could feel the Micmac burying ground calling to me. Once his voice had been dreamy and comforting. Now he was low and grim. Stay out of this, old man, or else. Lewis's Honda was gone from his garage. Without much hope, I leaned on the bell. Then went round the back. How about that? World's oldest burglar. Lewis? Lewis? I didn't find the worst signs. Gage's clothes folded and ready. His toys laid out like Christmas. Even so... The house had a sort of blank feel, as if it was waiting to be filled with... Well, with something. I went home again, took a six-pack out of the fridge, sat in the window, and waited. Yeah, can I have that um, medium rare and uh, fries and a salad? Would you like to see the dessert menu now, sir, or leave it till later? The food in the motel dining room was plentiful and dull, exactly what my body seemed to want. I sat near the door, half expecting, half hoping, to see someone I knew. That would lead to questions, complications, and maybe that's what I wanted. A way out. But I didn't see anyone. You're what? I'm going back home, Mom. Oh, Mommy, yes. 
<laughs> Rachel, you're upset. You and Ellie both. After a night's Dad, sleep, Dad, Mom, you'll... I'm sorry, but I have to go home. And if I can get a plane, I'm going tonight. Oh, tonight? No. Rachel, honey, this is a reaction to Gage's death. Understandable. Dad, but... be quiet. Would you believe? Can you understand? I can. Delta Airlines, Kim speaking. May I help you? I have to get from Chicago to Bangor tonight. Can you check the connections? It's very short notice. Please, it's an emergency. Okay. Hold the line, ma'am. Don't let them stop you, Mommy. No way, kid. It's important, isn't it? Yes. Can you tell me any more? Is it just the dream? No. It's everything now. It's running all through me. Can't you feel it, Mommy? Like a... Like a wind. Yes. Yes, I can. Still there, ma'am? Still here. I think you can make Bangor, but you'll get in late, and there's a lot of very tight connections. Back in my motel room, I watched eight half-hour comedy shows back-to-back until 11 o'clock. And I got off the bed and went out to do... Gage! What I guess I'd been fated to do from that very first moment. The tree-lined street that runs alongside Pleasant View Cemetery was deserted. I parked my car in a wing of darkness between two street lamps and got my tools out of the trunk. I looked around, then tossed the heavy canvas roll over the fence. Headlights. As the car crawled towards me, a flashlight beam stabbed out and flickered over the wrought iron fence. Cops checking the cemetery. My heart pounding, I stepped behind a tree and watched until the red tail lights vanished around the corner. There was a thick branch directly above me, extending clear over the fence. I began to climb. No! Knee! My knee! God! It doesn't matter. You're in. I located my tools wrapped in the tarp. Then I walked, or rather limped, over to Gage's grave. A headstone was in place. It read simply, Gage William Creed, followed by two dates, not so very far apart. Oh, oh, I'm sorry, ma'am. Portland flight's gone. Gone? It's gone. It rolled out onto oh. the runway three minutes oh. ago. If it's any consolation, ma'am, you made a hell of a good try. God! Oh, no. Oh. Seems like you really have to be in Portland, huh? Banger. Changing planes in Portland. Why not rent a car and drive to Banger? You'd be there by morning. I'd recommend a hotel, but if ever I saw a lady who looked like she really had to be somewhere... I'm that lady. Thanks! Takes a crane and a gang of navvies to open a ceiling vault, but a graveliner, one guy with a pick and shovel could do it if he was determined. Damn right there, Judd. And there was the coffin. The coffin I'd last seen at the gravesite at Gage's funeral. The safety deposit box in which I was supposed to bury all my ambitions and hopes for my son. Oh, now I'm gonna. Break you out of there, Gage. I'm gonna get you out of there. Whoa, what are you doing? Get a grip. Smash the catches with the spade. Open the lid. 
gently. It's Gage in that box. God. His head. His head is gone. No, that's impossible. Look again. Look again. It was some kind of moss growing on Gage's skin. So dark it looked black. Gently. Gently I used my handkerchief to wipe it off. Gage, I'm gonna take you out of there now, okay? It'll be all right. I swear, Gage, this will end soon. I love you, son. Daddy loves you. I have no idea how long I sat there rocking my son in my arms. Eventually, I got up, laid Gage on the tarpaulin, wrapped it around him, and bound it with tape. Then I threw the grave liner into the hole and shoveled back the dirt. When Gage's grave looked more or less as it had before, I slung the tools over my shoulder, lifted the stiff canvas roll gently in my aching arms, and went to find a way out. Rachel, where are you? You sound closer. I am closer. I'm, I'm at the Biddeford rest area on the main Biddeford. turnpike. Oh, I couldn't stay in Chicago. Whatever got to Elliot, it was getting to me, too. Chad, what's going on? You must tell me. I will. The whole story, I promise. But not on the phone. Oh, come, please. Rachel, check into a motel. Get some rest. I can't rest. Well, when you get to Ludlow, come straight here. Don't go home first. And I'll see you tomorrow. I went into the kitchen and brewed a pot of strong coffee. Took it back to the window and sat, sipping, watching. It kept me awake for a while, but then I began to nod again. I fought it hard, but I could feel the power of the Micmac burying ground sending me to sleep, hypnotizing me. Because Lewis was coming back and he wanted me out of the game. Half an hour after leaving Pleasant View, I turned off the highway and into my garage. Ten minutes later, I left the house carrying two canvas bundles, one slung over my shoulder, the other cradled in my arms. The path to the pet cemetery glowed in the darkness. Hey, I'm not so sure this is such a good idea, Lewis. What if we get lost? Hey, come on, city girl, we won't get lost. We've got a native guide. I reached the pet cemetery, dropped my tools, and collapsed, holding the rolled-up tarp carefully across my knees. Lucky the cat. 1986 to 1989, he was... Obedient. I got up, like an old man, picked up my burdens, and walked over to the deadfall. You must not go beyond this, no matter how much you feel the need. Just follow Lewis. Don't falter, don't hold on to anything, don't look down. I know the way, but it has to be done quick and sure. Next exit, Cumberland, Falmouth, Jerusalem's Lot. If living were a thing that I could buy, the rich would live and the poor would die. All my trials fall into Lewis. Oh, God! In some places, the path was so narrow I had to turn sideways to stop my bundle getting tangled in the brush. I seemed in the grip of a dream. Every so often, I looked down to check the body in my arms was a dead child in a tarpaulin and not a dead cat in a green hefty bag. At last, my steps turned downward, 
into the little god swamp. This is like the deadfall, Lewis. We've got to go steady and easy. Keep our heads. Mist swirled around me, glowing and pulsing like the beat of a strange heart. It's just the loons down south to all prospect. Sound carries. Yeah, right, Judd. Just the loons. Oh my God. Oh my dear God. I fell to my knees, clutching Gage to my chest. The damp air took on a sickening smell like warm, spoiled pork. Ah, it's the great and terrible. The Wendigo. Dear God, that was the Wendigo. The creature that stalks the North Country. That can touch you and make you a cannibal. Steps here. Cut into the rock. When we get to the top, we're there. The Micmac burial ground. I stood on that weird, bare, high rock swaying with exhaustion. For the first time, I saw that the cairns, every one of them, had been burst apart as the thing buried beneath had come back to life and clawed its way out. There, Gage. Feel the power? Not long now. Not long. Miss, huh? could you fill it up again, please? Hmm. Never knew our coffee was addictive before. You must be on to your second gallon. Um, where where is this? You don't know where you are? No, I, I've been driving most of the night. Uh, I, I kind of lost track. You're two miles out of Pittsfield. So, the banger would be 60 miles straight up the road. I don't remember walking back from the burial ground any more than I did that first time with Judd. I've got a dim memory of the deadfall, and the next thing I knew, I was in my kitchen, with Church looking at me out of those dull yellow eyes. Go on, scat! Get out of here! I just wanted to fall straight into bed, fully clothed, sleep forever, and not dream. But first I opened my black bag. There were syringes and several ampules of morphine. I snapped the bag shut, put it by the bed, and slept. No. No! Just before dawn, while I was still snoring in my chair by the window, there were footsteps outside Lois's room. Slow, clumsy. A smell came with them. A stench. Even asleep, Lois tried to turn away. A shadow I entered his bedroom. Up till he fell back. Tossed aside drugs, bandages. Such till he found what he was looking for, then held it Yes. so that it gleamed silver in the early morning light. Then the shadow left and came to pay me a call. Louis? Oh, my God. Timmy Bateman. Gage? Gage, is that? No! Oh, church, scram. Get out of here! Think, think, you stupid old man. It's not too late. You may have come back, but you can still kill it. A knife, you need a knife. It was then that Gage came into the room. Oh, I used to be Gage. Moss grew on his burying suit, fouled his white shirt. His fine blonde hair was caked with dirt. 
One eye stared off into space. The other was fixed on me. Hello, Jed. Come on. Come and get me, whatever you are. I've come to send your rotten old soul straight to hell. Yeah. Well, that's a place you'd know all about, ain't it? I've been there. I saw no more. She's burning down there, Jed. No. Yes, because she did it with all your friends upstairs. No. In your bed. What do you think of that, Judge? You're lying. What do you think of that? Your whores, Judson. What do you think of that? Did you know all about your whores, Judson? But you never knew you married one, did you? The biggest whore of all. What do you think of that? Stop it. Stop it, you little... Cat, get off! Ah! Now it's your turn to be it. Oh, Lord, sweetheart. It, 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 it. Yep. Okay. <sighs> Thank you. Thank you. I was going to do. That's... <sighs> Thank you. Thank you so much. The table was right off. What's gonna do? That's nothing. A kid could have fixed with it. Maybe the cable was right off, but it's queer. Looks interstate. Someone's been messing with it. It was 5 a.m. when I turned off the interstate onto Route 15 and headed for Ludlow. The coffee had woken me up a lot. I, I wasn't the slightest bit dozy, but I had that crazy feeling that I was being manipulated. The cable coming off like that holding me up just long enough. <laughs> long enough for what? Long enough for something terrible to happen. Be careful, Mommy. Please, be careful. 20 minutes later, I pulled up outside that old white frame house that I'd first seen on that August day such a long, long time ago. When you get to Ludlow, come straight in. John? John, are you home? down. There were muddy footprints on the porch. John! Tracks of small feet. Tra muddy footprints on the porch. Of small feet. Tracks of Gage's feet. I looked at them and I suddenly felt very afraid. John? Church? What are you doing in here? I backed away into a wall and a picture fell down as Oz the Great and Terrible. It, it smashed. And I ran out of the room screaming, Zelda's dead, Zelda's dead, Zelda's dead. Judd? Judd, where are you? Dreams about what? About Zelda. She's coming to get me. She engaged for letting them both die. Judd, is that you? Judd! I finally came back for you, Rachel, like I promised. Zelda? Hello, Mommy. Gage? Gage! Oh, my darling! I've got a surprise for you, Mommy. A big, shiny surprise. Which hand is it in, Mommy? Come on, guess which hand. Who is it? It's Erwin. Erwin? Your father-in-law, Lewis. Are you all right? Sorry, Erwin. I, I've just woken up. Did Rachel make it home last night? Rachel? She should be with you by now. Isn't she there? No, I... No, she, she's not. Damn. She insisted on flying back. She must have missed a connection. <sighs> What's the matter? It's Ellie. She had a terrible dream. We had to take her to the hospital. Oh, my God. Tracks. Small, muddy tracks. 
leading to the far side of the bed. Gage had been here in the night. Lewis? Lewis, are you there? Lewis! Sorry, it's a poor line. Uh, what were you saying about Ellie? She had a bad dream, a whole series of them. She was hysterical. We had to take her to the hospital. Did they sedate her? They gave her a pill, yes. She went back to sleep. She's sleeping now. Did she say what scared her so badly? Ellie said... Uh, I gave Dory quite a turn. I can tell you she was almost hysterical herself. She said, Oz, the great and terrible, had killed her mother. Just like that. The way Zelda used to say it. Lewis, have you told Ellie about Zelda? Lewis, are you there? Will she be all right? What did the doctor say? Delayed shock. When she wakes up, she might not remember anything. Lewis, when Rachel gets there, make her come back. And you must come with her. Your son is dead, Lewis, but your daughter is very much alive and she needs you. Yeah. Thanks, Erwin. We'll do that. Just as soon as we can. Out. Did Ellie say anything else? Uh, uh, only one other thing I could make out. She said, Pascal says it's too late. I hung up the phone. Gage's tracks led to my medical bag. My scalpel was missing. I remembered the dream I'd had just before waking. It involved Judd and Rachel. They were screaming. There was a flashing blade and blood. So much blood. Parked behind Judd's... Across the road, a car parked behind Judd's van. It looked like itself. Rachel's here. Why don't you kill yourself? You've got all you need in your bag. Needles, morphine. Why don't you do it? Now. I would. But I need this for something else. Gage is still out there. When I crossed the road, I saw a church curled up on the roof of the rental car. He stretched and looked at me out of his dull yellow eyes. Wow. Hi, church. Want some grub? Wow. Dumbass is red school. These days I get Steve to give me injections. Glad to see I haven't lost my touch. I glanced into the car as I passed. It was dead. Again, purse and scarf were on the seat. Glanced into the car as I passed. Purse and scarf were on the seat. Gage? Small. Gage! I followed the tracks. Grave dirt left by Gage's small feet. Crisscrossed by paw prints in something dark and sticky. So sorry. Judd Crandall, live across the road. You're the dog, ain't you? Yes, Louis Creed. This is my wife, Rachel, my daughter, Ellie, and the kid with the bee sting is Gage. Well, good to know you all. I'd once seen Norma take a linen tablecloth from a drawer. Deepest scarlet began to stain the white lawn. Gage? White lawn. Gage? Oh my God. My wife was lying halfway down the landing. Dear God. The way she was propped against the wall, she might have dozed off reading in bed, except for the blood. Daddy, you come to me. Oh, no, you don't! Come his shirt! I was on him, straddling him, one knee pinning the hand that held the scalpel. As I clawed for the high blows, the thing underneath me bucked and strained like a greased fish. It nearly threw me off. The first needle went in, and its face changed into Judd's face, dead and staring. The ruined, bloody mask of Victor Pascal. Myself, 
pale and mad. I jabbed another syringe into Gage's arm and pushed the plunger right down. The frantic struggles grew less. Stopped. And for a moment I saw the face of my son. My real son. Unhappy and full of pain. Hush, little baby, don't you cry. You know your mama was born to die. All my trials, Lord, soon be over. When I first saw the smoke, I thought it was Lou's place burning. His luck had been shot to hell ever since Victor Pascal died in his arms on the floor of our infirmary. But when I got closer, I saw it was the house of the old guy across the street. I pulled in, dismounted, and put the Harley on its kickstand. How'd it happen? Dunno. Maybe Judd fell asleep with a cigarette. I crossed the road. Though if Lewis was at home, surely he'd be out there with the others. Then I glimpsed something. Behind Lewis's house, a neatly mown I through the woods. And there, for the brief moment, I thought I saw a man carrying a large white bundle. Lewis? Lou! Lewis! I hardly noticed the graves, the scraps of board and slate. My eyes were fixed on the far side of the clearing, where Lewis was climbing a deadfall in outright defiance of gravity. Lou! Lou! Didn't you hear me calling? Hello, Steve. Lewis stopped. His hair was white. His face was that of an old, old man. Come with me, Steve. Help me carry her. You're too long with Gage and something got in. Was she? Well, I know it will. Long with Gage and something got into him. Steve? Hi. Well, I know it will. I leave. Steve? Hi. I could never climb that. Look, Dad. Follow me, Steve. Don't falter. Don't hold on to anything. Don't look down. It has to be done quick and sure, and it has to be done today. I'm coming, Lou. I'm coming. You your voices. Lewis, please tell me. But it's just the loons down south towards Prospect. The sound carries. It was so close. I felt a magnet out in those woods, pulling at something in my brain, dragging me towards... Lost interest in me. I never went lost interest in me. I never went back to Ludlow. A few months later, I got a job in Denver, Colorado, and left Maine for good. That afternoon, the police came and asked questions. Smoke still rose from the ashes across the road. I spoke to the police outside. I wore a hat, so they didn't see my white hair. Red seven on the black eight. Ace of clubs out. Take up the king. I kept my hands out of sight, too, because they were bloody and ruined. Black eight on the red nine. Ace of hearts out. Two of clubs. Black queen on the red king. Rachel. My darling. In Pet Cemetery by Stephen King, dramatized for radio by Gregory Evans. John Sharian was Lewis. Bryony Glasgow, Rachel. Lee Montague, Judd. And Sarah Benishu, Ellie. Stuart Milligan was Steve, Helen Horton, Norma, Mark Bonner, Victor Pascal, and Alice Arnold, Holly. William Roberts was Erwin Goldman, Liza Ross, Dory, Kerry Shale, Timmy Bateman, Gordon Stern, Bill Bateman, and Alan Tilvan, Hannibal Benson. 
Garrick Hagen was the minister, Johan Meredith the undertaker, Shirley Dixon, Missy Dandridge, Colleen Prendergast, Kim, Sean Baker, George, Erin Williams, Zelda, and Percy Ringrose, Lee Sage. Technical assistants were Peter Ringrose, Lee Sperry, and Jonathan Glover. And the production assistants were Miriam Soupy and Charlotte Bar. Original music was by David Chilton and Nick Russell Pavia. Pet Cemetery was directed by Gordon House. This has been a presentation of Simon & Schuster Audio.